Can I help with these people in the waiting room? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, just verifying that they're members or supporters. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, oh, I don't know what you've been doing to do that. Sorry, I should have checked in earlier. Ha <laughs> ha. All good. So, um, some of them have uh, their full name listed, which is nice because Zoom seems to be a somewhat professional, professionally used thing. Otherwise, uh, let people in and private message, get an email address, check it against the database. And if they're not a member, kick them out. No, just, just kidding. We're, um, so in that case, we just will let people know they can't vote if they're not a member. Yeah, exactly. So that's the main reason for checking in is to see um, members obviously count towards quorum and are able to vote um, for our motions, whereas non-members are not able to. So I was just dis distinguishing between those, get the numbers right. Roger, it's David. I've just got a question. Yeah. Does everyone have to have their own individual um, page or can two people be on the one Zoom link? Um, you can use the same link, I guess, if you're if you're like sharing a screen or um I'm not sure if Zoom actually lets multiple people log in. It usually kicks you out, although I think Andrea and I are actually using the same account, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, for the for the sake of voting, so just to, to get a little bit ahead, um, I'm probably just gonna look at using the hands up thing in Zoom and counting. Um, so, Perhaps if you've got uh, an extra person there who's a member, uh, just let us know. Uh, maybe just chuck in the chat um, and we'll note it down as it's essentially a proxy, right? So whoever is with you. Cool. Uh, thanks. All right, um, still got a couple of people in the waiting room, so we'll get those uh, those people verified and in, and then um, and then we'll kick off. Let's see. Roger, who, sh who is verifying non-pirate members? Uh, Andrea. Um, so the, the co-hosts who aren't me. Cool. Yes, pretty much. And Saha's there as well.
I was going to have this fancy screen up as a waiting screen while everyone came in, but um, totally forgot, which is fine. All right, so we might get, uh, get started then. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. So for those who don't know me, my name is Roger Watling. I'm the current president and secretary of Fusion Political Party. So we'll call this meeting to order. Um, and welcome to the annual general meeting for Fusion Party uh, 2022. Very exciting. It's our first joint AGM since the merger. Um, although we did have a special general meeting in April, so it's not the first time we've had a, a joint meeting. Um, Australia is a beautiful country. I'm really glad to be living here, particularly with what's going on in other places around the world. Um, and as Part of that, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all dial in from. So it's a little bit different. We're all coming from different parts of this great country. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'm gonna get rid of that screen and stop sharing. Let's start with. All right, so. Um, a little bit about how today is going to run. Hopefully it'll be done fairly quickly. There's a couple of hours probably worth to go through. So first up, um, we'll accept the minutes from the SGM, from the special general meeting that was held in April. Uh, we've got a few speeches to get through and then some motions, which include a special resolution for changes to the constitution. Uh, we'll allow some questions and discussions on each. Um, however, noting that the text for the special resolution cannot be changed without notice to all members. So that can't be varied on today. Um, let's see, we'll, uh, we'll move on to speeches from the nominees for executive committee. That's gonna be exciting first, first time allowing for um, that to go out to all members. Uh, for Fusion, which is very cool. And then we'll close out with general business um, and strategy discussion, bit of an open tail then for people who want to hang around. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few topics that are brought up throughout the day um, that we could go deeper into. It'll take a bit of time, so we'll leave that to the end of the meeting. Uh, all right, just a few notes on meeting etiquette as well um, so that we can keep track as much as possible, I'll ask that questions and comments are held generally to the end of each section, uh, unless specifically called for. Feel free to use the chat. Um, yep, yeah, chat's going strong, um, which is great. Um, but please be respectful of the speakers. Uh, ensure that your mic is muted as well for anyone who's not currently, uh, unless you're talking or being addressed. Um, if you do have comments or questions, hold on to them, hold on to your thoughts, raise your hand function, uh, if you know where that is in Zoom, and we'll get through to you as we can. Uh, now we do accept proxies for general meetings. So I'll do a quick tally and tell us we have Some proxies, where is that screen? 26, 27 proxies. Okay, so that's important because proxies go towards um, our quorum as well. Um, all right. I think that's, that's it. We. How many people we got at the moment? 29 in the call and 27. What's 29 plus 27? Less than 90. Fair call. Thank you. Uh, yes, so I think we needed 97-ish uh, um, for, for quorum. So we are short of that. Um, so it's not, we won't be able to proceed with decisions, so motions, 
what I will do though is still run through the agenda as planned. We can have the discussion around those motions and then um, we will work out a time to um, reconvene uh, and to adjourn this meeting to um, how does that sound to everyone? Sounds good. Cool. Got yeah. thumbs up. That's great. Um, just to make it easy for everyone, given that we don't have quorum, um, and in case uh, people do have other things they would prefer to go onto if they're not sticking around, given that we are recording uh, the meeting, I might take an opportunity to um, call for opinions on when to uh, adjourn the meeting to next. So our constitution allows for another meeting within 21 days. Notice again goes out to all members. Um, we'll reconvene at that time. And if quorum is not met within 30 minutes of that meeting starting, then we'll proceed as uh, as planned as if there was quorum. So um, given that there's not quorum at the moment and probably a few off getting it, um, then the next, next meeting might be the one where we um, enable that voting. Um, yeah. Um Given that we've already given three weeks notice of the special resolution to change the constitution, I assume mm -hmm. we don't have to make it three weeks. We don't have to have, use the maximum three weeks. No. no In which so. case, yeah, we're planning to have the executive committee elections go for the next two weeks. So in two weeks' time, seems like a good time to come back. Yeah, that's right. So I think we've allowed, yep, just like you said, two weeks for... Um, for the election, uh, which will be held completely online. So we don't need to necessarily uh, get quorum in this session. We'll be uh, doing that offline or online, digitally outside of this meeting. Um, so two weeks time would make it November 6. Um, how does November 6 sound for people? Can I get an, uh, an indication with thumbs up if it's a yes? Um, check your diaries. Looks like a fair few thumbs coming in. It should be somewhat shorter as well. So we'll cover off the main topics in this session. And then the next one will be... Um, just to finalise those those motions. So that looked like a resounding thumbs up. So we will uh, look to target another meeting in two weeks' time on Sunday, the 6th of November. Thank you very much. Um, but we will continue on. So for those who are keen to listen in on the activities of the last year um, and to listen from our um, nominees for executive committee for the next next term. Please hang, hang on, because uh, this will be a good session. Um, all right, so just getting kicked off then, I want to um, give a quick shout out to all the current uh, executive that have um, worked with us throughout the last year. Uh, so whether you're continuing in your position or not, uh, obviously the contribution to furthering the purposes of fusion has been, um, you know, astronomical, I think, over the last year. So thank you very much, uh, Andrea. You were the uh, president for the first first half, and I'll call on you shortly um, to, to give a bit of a report back on, on that time. Uh, Peter Johnson as convener, thank you for your steadying voice um throughout throughout the year uh you brought a massive amount of experience and passion as well to the group um michael as treasurer uh and party agent probably have the most on the on the line um personally and managing the books through an election cycle can't be easy so thank you for all the work you've done there uh cammy 
as our registered officer as well. Thank you for your passion towards the environment, the party, and that trailer you did for the election. That was um, that was intense. So thank you very much. And of course, um, our branch representatives from all the different branches as well. All right. So uh, we'll kick off with some speeches uh, and report backs. I'll ask um, Andrea Leon if um, if you'd like to to go first as our as our first president um, after the merger. Yep. Thank you very much, Roger. So I get to report on the first half of Fusion's first half year, which is it's the fun half. It's where the where we came together and uh, ran in our first election. Um, so one year ago, the Science Party, Pirate Party, Secular Party, Vote Planet and Climate Change Justice Party committed to joining forces to become Fusion. We were prompted into the talks by new legislation that increased the minimum membership requirements, but it was a smart decision in any case, and I'm very glad that we did it. Our policy platform's broader, our geographic reach is wider, and we offer more uh, breadth and depth to the people of Australia than we did before. During August and September last year, representatives of uh, eight, nine, ten small parties, honestly, it was a historic series of meetings between small parties, um, took place. And uh, that is where the founding parties uh, decided to form fusion uh, due to the way that we saw we shared a vision in politics for Australia. We sent off our application to create a new party to the Electoral Commission one year ago on the 25th of October, 2021. And that was a separate process, the registration, uh, that was separate to the membership check with the increased membership requirements. So we had these two parallel processes, um, just letting you in on the administrative madness that it was. So the AEC was processing the name change and all the founders were working to pass the membership check, which we did with no problem. Um, and not all of the parties in Australia's varied political landscape survived. 17 parties have been deregistered in the past year, which is far more than usual in any one year. There's only 35 parties registered now, which sounds like a lot, but um, it is, it's far less. That legislation has had its desired effect of reducing the competition for the major parties. Uh, anyway, Fusion's name change was eventually approved on the 2nd of March this year, and we got stuck into campaigning for our first election, the 2022 federal election. We had decades of wisdom and experience between us all. Um, the Secular Party was uh, the uh, had the longest experience of any of us with their first election as a registered party being in 2010. Fusion mustered up 19 candidates across five states, so Senate candidates in all five mainland states and nine lower house candidates. It was a tough election with the media focused on the major parties' scandals and news polls and what seemed to be an inevitable shift in government um, after such a long period of disappointing governance for the country. I had honestly hoped to retain all of the voters that had voted for the founding parties and win their combined vote. Um, as it turned out, we won about 0.4% of the primary vote in the Senate, which was on par with where the Science Party and the Pirate Party had separately been in the previous election, 2019. So we didn't manage to combine and grow our vote, but we did hold our position on the ladder. Um, so that said, this was also our first election under a new name and it was difficult to get that uh, that message out there. So it is pretty great that we connected with 50,000 voters for the Senate and 13,000 voters across nine lower house electorates. So over 50,000 voters in the Senate gave Fusion their number one vote. And I'm very thankful for everyone who made that happen. After the election in May, I stepped down from the role of president to focus on communications, um, which is a bit of a passion of mine. Um, and we've since set up monthly newsletters and monthly meetings. So thanks to everyone for contributing to those and attending. Um, the 
party is um, as strong as the, the members that are contributing to it. We're still figuring out a lot of our processes as we go. And as we do that, Roger bravely stepped into the role of president for the last five months. And um, I'll, I'll hand over to Roger now for the rest of the president's report. So thank you to everyone who has contributed. It has been truly momentous. I, I don't think there has been a, a moment in Australian politics like the one we had a year ago when Fusion was formed. Thanks, Andrea. That was great. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's great thinking back to to those times, even though it was only a year ago, even just a little bit less um, for a lot of, of what went on, but the amount of, uh, of effort that went through. What a wild year, right? Um, so you've covered off, obviously, on most of what happened pre-election. A um, couple of extra notes that uh that i i recalled it was october last year as well that um that we selected the name so uh, fusion won out over electron much to ron's disappointment um we registered fusionparty.org.au for the first time as well so that's that all happened in in october obviously Selecting the name was was a big precursor to uh, what Andrew mentioned around the official name change as we took on uh, took over essentially the uh, the association from um, from Vote Planet. Uh, so there was there was quite a bit of work that went into that. Uh, December was the time when the first executive committee uh, of the combined parties was brought together. Um, so that was filling all the roles that were voluntarily vacated from Vote Planet uh, members at the time as well. Um, so in May, after the election, Australia finally voted out the Morrison-led Liberal National Party. Um, anyone who has any hopes of LNP improving after ScoMo's ousting, um, I'm guessing we'll probably have to wait a little longer uh, with Peter Dutton as the new leader there and the um, leader of the opposition. We have a majority Labor government. Uh, they've been relatively quick to get to some of their, their agenda. Of course, um, nothing's ever gonna be perfect. It definitely hasn't been with them. Um, at least I feel a little bit better than I did before, before May, um, but we'd like to see more. And that's why Fusion um, continues to move forward and to bring a new type of, of politics um, to Australia. Um, all right. So I took over, uh, as Andrew mentioned, in June this year as, as president. Uh, and since then, we've been working with the executive committee to start setting up the party structures uh, that we want to continue forward with um, after the hectic work that has been done um, by everyone up to the election. That was way back in May. And like in the federal uh, politics, we want to do more. Um, and that's the main focus of the executive going forward is doing more. And I wanna make sure that everyone knows that um, we all play a part in building this party. So all, all of us, um, but Fusion in its current form is really still just a baby. And we're in the process of learning to walk let alone sprinting. It's fusion, as uh, Andrea mentioned, brought together members from five different smaller parties. Each party had their own different ways of doing things. We're also happy to be welcoming new members to Fusion who are not associated with any of those founding, member, uh, founding parties. So everyone has their own opinion on how the party should be operated. The thing that I know uh, that we all strongly agree on is that we want to make, um, you know, it's the members that make what Fusion is today. Doesn't matter who the president is or anyone else on the executive. But if we were to grow, we want and need to have greater engagement with our, with our members and with the communities we live in. So we've defined the functional areas 
uh, that we'll need for future growth and action by consolidating the previous working groups into four distinct subcommittees. The subcommittees at this stage aren't incredibly important, but they are the structures that will enable the party to scale. So as Andrew mentioned, our communications focus is on making sure our message is getting out there and that it's clear and professional. If Fusion is to be a real contender, we must present ourselves as a voice worth listening to. And Andrew is doing a great job overseeing that area. Anyone interested in things to do with messaging, media, design, content, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Andrea. We have our socials, we have a monthly newsletter now. They're all looking for content, and we just recently, oh, we just recently made a couple of official um, submissions as well, which is uh, really exciting. So get involved with that um, parliamentary submissions uh, in the name of Fusion, which is really exciting. So a massive threat to a party in the current state that Fusion is in, as well as having members lose interest between elections. Thankfully, we've got Saha Khalili paving the way in, um, of engagement and finding ways to keep the conversation active. So if people is your jam, keep you across current topics, conversations in the party, reach out, uh, reaching out to members and supporters, then have a chat to Saha. Thanks, Saha. Uh, the party's also had its first attempt at a state election campaign. And while we haven't been successful in getting the party registered in Victoria, more learnings are coming out of the experience that will go toward improving our next federal elections. So campaigns is Miles Whitaker's middle name, and he's keen to keep building out the campaigning infrastructure in as many locations as possible uh, ahead of future elections. So if you're interested in campaigning, campaign organizing in your local area or just in general, reach out to Miles. And the last, but, uh, but certainly not least, uh, and Tyrone, you were calling this out before we kicked off as well, um, policy development, it's back underway. So this area needs a lot of attention. So we can't just jump straight into new policy or what's hip right now. As mentioned earlier, Fusion uh, being new, we don't even have an established method of developing and agreeing on policy. Founding parties still have significant amounts of their existing platforms that need to be reviewed, potential adoption or adaption in the Fusion platform. And there's a lot of work to be done there. So if you'd like to get involved, let anyone in the executive know um, so that you can be included in future conversations. Another exciting piece that we've been um, actively working on over the last few months within the party is developing a values framework for fusion that will ultimately underpin everything that we do. So especially with future policy. So it enables a benchmark to test ideas against and also to guide a guide for areas where there might be specifically, where we might not have specifically covered by our uh, policy platform. Um, now, I'm not going to do this much justice, but I do have a slide that um, I wanted to share that will show what those values are. So these are the values that have been identified by, um, oh, I haven't even shared, go oh, share. There we go. All right. Uh, so these are the values that we've identified as being those that underpin the majority of our shared platforms across all the, the different parties. So we've had the leadership and executive groups from the different parties involved in this, as well as other members um, who, are, who are active across all the different parties involved in this discussion. Um, Deep, diving deep into what's the core uh, of, of what Fusion stands for. Um, now, I wish Drew was here to explain why this looks the way it does. I've tried to put it in a way that I will be able to explain it somewhat. 
and I won't harp on it for, for too long. I've got, we've got a lot to get through, but I think this is something that uh, if anyone's interested in hanging around afterwards, we can dive deeper into anyway. So this is based on a hierarchy, kind of upside down. So if you imagine the top of the hierarchy is technically what we value the most, but not at the expense of the next thing. So these came from, from the majority of our, of our groups, uh, individual freedom, advancement, deep ecologies that, that encompasses a, a lot around uh, you know, environment and climate and interacting with our environments and that relationship um, with ecology, safety, ethical conduct and equity. So we want to have, for example, use just the top ones. Um, individual freedom talks talks to our our, um, our individual rights as a as a person, but we don't want to have that trump advancement in other areas. Likewise, we don't want advancement to trump our relationship with the ecology and so on. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Go back. Anyway, so that's um, that's the work that's been going on at the moment. Drew Wolfendale has been facilitating some really great workshops um, around this, and we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, this is just the top layer. Out of this come a whole bunch of principles that will be developed over time, and that will will really be the foundation for our policies and our um, our being essentially as a political party. So we'll come back to that, um, I'm sure, in the discussion at the end as well. Um, all right, find my place in the notes. Cool. So that's also open to anyone who wants to be involved. So reach out um, again to the executive group. I'm a bit of a pause currently working through that. Um, but with the intent of picking it up and for diving deep into the principles again. So that's going to be um, a job for, for this term's executive to bring those values to life and to, to kick off the next phase there. So if you're interested in getting involved in those discussions, please reach out. Um, additionally to this, the executive has endorsed uh, engaging with our party membership around a review of the name of the party. Um, so it's important for us to be able to uh, have a name that means something to all of us and to our communities, um, a name that will be recognized in households and on ballot papers. So Fusion was selected relatively quickly as part of the merger process at the end of last year. And it didn't really get a chance to go out to all the members of the party. And it made sense at the time, right? It was a it was a fusion of of multiple parties, so it really stood for what we what we were at the time. Um, Peter will probably discuss this in a little bit more detail as well, um, but we will be opening up the discussion of the party name for consideration for change. Now, it doesn't mean that it will change. So fusion is still a very viable option. Um, there's a lot of people who have grown to, to love it over time, and it does really mean a lot of, a lot of great things. Um, we just want to be sure that it's the best name that represents the party for a long and healthy political future. All right. Um, so here we are one year in to our joint journey. Um, I want to do a quick show of numbers as well um, just because I'm in a sort of joint president and secretary role 
again. So breakdown by state. Uh, this has been asked for um, by a few members lately in our monthly catch-ups. I generally do the breakdown um, by branch, which are the, the original parties. So this is a really good view to show like how many people we've got um, across the different states. This will help us to plan for future future um, state elections as well. You see Victoria and New South Wales neck and neck. Um, Queensland, ACT, WA a little bit behind and then South Australia, Tasmania. And we do actually have a few people in Northern Territory, which is really cool. So if you're dialing in from the NT, welcome. Um, now these numbers are a little bit uh, inflated. Uh, and by that, what I mean is this includes all of our voting members, which for the Pirate Party actually goes a, extends a little bit beyond the expiration um, date of, of membership. So this is the, the current numbers as per um, required for, for this AGM. Victoria and New South Wales are, um, that's really close. Didn't even see that when I was typing that in. Anyone got any questions around membership? Just just a comment to say that Victoria would be um, so far ahead of its uh, population proportion in general because we've just had a membership drive with the upcoming Victorian election. Very true. Very true. Uh, yes. So Victoria will have a lot of new members, new members there. There was definitely, I think last month alone was close to 30. Um, I, think I think about the same month before as well looking yeah. at our lapsed members that signed back on. Awesome. Go Victoria. Um, so yeah, that's a really good, really good point and, and a good, good call out for, for the other, other states um, to re-engage with, with past members um, as well. Cool. All right, um, so I'm almost almost done. I'll stop my rambling. Um, but before I do, uh, I did want to just give my thoughts briefly on the future of Fusion for the next executive and for all members um, to consider. Um, my hopes for, for Fusion is that it continues to work towards uniting our membership and our supporters yeah, under a single strong banner, whether that's Fusion or, or we pick a, another name, whatever that is, that needs to stick. Um, and, it, and everyone needs to gather under that. Uh, thanks to the work that's been done um, on the shared values and, and principles. In my view, there's no need to continue with the current branch structure um, that is based on the founding parties. So I know there's a lot of history there and a lot of effort has been put into building up those parties. Um, and, and we appreciate everything that everyone's done as part of that. The reality is though, with the, with the requirement um, for minimum numbers going up, uh, there's, there's not much opportunity um, for those original parties to get re-registered. And I think the last year has shown that our combined efforts are, are worthwhile keeping together. So our greatest chance of making change in the political space is to really unite and to build a strong political movement, working together for the future of our communities. Big Fusion has an opportunity to be more than just a rebellion against the existing parties. Fusion can bring about a shift in thinking to Australian politics, implementing changes towards a well thought out future, not knee jerk reactions. So we need a shift in the way that people think about politics, the economy and the planet. We can't do that by holding on to outdated ideologies. 
and focusing too much on what others are doing. It's really time for Fusion to stand up and be recognized. So in closing, I'm really proud to have been part of the founding executive team uh, as secretary and for some of it as president. Also to have run as a Senate candidate um, in Queensland in the federal election and to have been generally part of this great group of people. I'm certain that the next year will continue to build on the foundations that have been set with maybe some new faces on the executive and hopefully more participation across the whole party. So I have a feeling I've missed a lot of important things that have happened, but um, I think that's that's it from me. Um, anyone got any questions for Andrea or myself? Nope. All right. Um, in that case, we'll move straight on to the next, next agenda item, um, which is our treasurer report. Um, Michael. Thank you, Roger. Um, I'll let you control the slides since there's just two of them, if that's cool. No um, worries. Let's try and find it. Uh, so I will uh, keep this relatively brief uh, for the sake of time. Uh, that, uh, other than uh, usually I would, I, in, in certain cases, I would go through sort of the things in more detail. Um, happy to answer any questions, so sort of additional questions uh, as we go or, um, or afterwards. Um, but I will keep to the uh, the general items that are general uh, that, are, that are mostly required for this report. Um, so the first, some of this data is stuff that uh, you may have seen in the monthly meetings. Uh, this is usually I do a monthly uh, wrap up of each month. Um, this one is for the full financial year of 2022. So um, the obviously notable um, events of this this is a is is sort of a, a busier uh, financial year than ones where there are no elections, uh, but it is also the start of Fusion. So uh, the, the accounts started with um, the Vote Planet account that became uh, the, the first Fusion account. And uh, <clears throat> there is a note to be made first uh, that there are a few parts of our financial responsibilities that are a little up in the air based on the idea of or based on the uh the requirements from the AEC and uh advice we have received from the AEC in the in in, in recent uh weeks so um with fusion having been a uh, a merger of multiple parties those parties themselves had uh their own financial situations prior to the uh, merger and uh, the we have we have requested advice both from the AEC and more recently independent advice as to ensuring that we are compliant and meeting all of the requirements through base uh, via uh, so required of us from both the AEC as well as uh, Victorian Consumer Affairs uh, and the ATO. But that's that's a less of a important or that we have fewer obligations there. Uh, so. The, the main point prior, prior I raise this is that with the very recent AEC financial return, uh, we have submitted both payment and receipts for the entirety of Fusion, including the branch's previous financial uh, structures. Whereas this report is specifically for the association that is Fusion Political Party uh, for the AGM purposes. So the amounts that are in this balance sheet and the and the profit and loss are different from the from that that has been submitted to the AEC. Just in case there are uh, comparisons made to those down the line. So after that, um, so back, back with 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 that said, I will just run through these. So this is as at the end of the financial year, so thirtieth of June, and uh, the multiple accounts that we have there of the statement account and Stripe account. Stripe is just where we receive donations via our website. So that gets automatically transferred into the account. So at the time there was just some amount of, of $3,198 that hadn't been sent through and the account had $28,362.98. So total of the 31,000 figure you see below. Um, 
There was an amount of liabilities there that as at the time of the end of the financial year, uh, most of the majority of this was reimbursements to candidates. So we have processed uh, a number of, so all of the donations that went to candidate pages were given, were, were allocated to be, to reimburse the relatively large personal costs that majority of our candidates needed to um, need, incurred in order to run, including the $2,000 registration fee. Uh, for each candidate. So at the, at this time, not all of those had been out. So this isn't sort of weird debts that we we're in or something like that. This is just uh, unallocated reimbursements in this case. So uh, 17,000 there. So over the course of the entire, um, so yeah, so the, the, the net assets there at the end of the financial year and Zoom has it has the thing blocking me, but I'm pretty sure that's $13,826. Uh, oh, that's the next slide, but... Um, yeah, so thirteen thousand eight hundred twenty-six dollars and eleven cents. Um, so that's that's the financial position as at the end of the financial year. So if we just jump into the next slide, I'll just run through the the expenditure. Um, so well, firstly, income. So expense contributions in this income. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over the interest of fifty-seven cents. That's not uh, very interesting. Uh, expense contributions is just a separate line item from donations, as it is uh, value. It's figures that candidates had uh, contributed to the bank account for the purposes of uh, their own campaign. So this fits just differently under, um, under the sort of the tax implications and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, then monetary gift in kind is all of the donations. So usually uh, I'll, I'll sort of say this every time, but obviously a huge thank you to everyone who has donated and made all of the things uh, we've been able to do possible. So not only is it has, uh, most of those donations have been towards uh, candidates during the time, which just allows that, allows those campaigns to, to exist, uh, but also for us to just keep the lights on. There are various expenses that we have uh, that, that, uh, that, that we sort of require on a monthly or yearly basis. So uh, just going through the operating expenses. Now, a number of these are, uh, the combination of these are, are things that the party spent um, as, as per the party, and some of it is uh, the any any uh, costs that were incurred by uh, candidates with, that were then reimbursed by the party uh, are counted as expenditure expenditure here. So when we say uh, administration fees and expenses in the first item of seventeen thousand, that is going to be predominantly uh, there, there will be some of that will be things like um, Victorian consumer affair fees that we've had to pay for constitution changes and things like that. Uh, but the majority of that is going to be. Uh, donations that went to reimburse candidate uh, registration fees with AEC. Uh, advertising is going to be a combination of uh, Facebook and Google, uh, various sort of just general advertising that we did for candidates uh, the, uh, over, the, over the course of those things. Uh, Freight and Courier is um, pretty, pretty light. We didn't do a whole lot of that, but it's mostly some of the expenses we had sending off uh, sort of flyers or various things uh, at certain points. Um, a general expenses is, I understand, very vague, but that's actually just a remaining allocation as at the time end of the, the period for uh, some uh, reimbursements that had not been actually yet allocated to a, uh, a particular uh, account at this point. Uh, IT services and subscriptions is just a, some of the online services we pay for, so official Fusion email addresses is one of the main ones. Uh, there, are, there are some expenses that have occurred in the next month, so not in this financial year, for things like Nation Builder, which is what we use for the website and, and various things like that. That's a lot more. Um, merchandise is shirts for the most part. I believe that it was only shirts. It was mostly shirts. Might have been some stickers and things like that that, that uh, went around to, but mostly shirts for volunteers uh, during on election day and other events. Printing and stationery would be primarily reimbursements towards candidates for flyers and core flutes. Uh, there's a couple of banners that we had in various cases as well. Uh, transaction fees is uh, going to be just, oh, it's, it's, it's going to be almost completely Stripe fees. So anytime we receive donations, we pay a little bit of, there's a little bit of a clip on that. Or we receive donations via the website. Uh, that's a sort of a cost of doing business there. Uh, travel expenses was, again, just a couple of uh, of a small amount of uh, reimbursements that were allocated uh, for assisting 
and it's sort of the same thing as the next one, just the volunteer expenses, various things where uh, sort of volunteers were reimbursed for particular costs um in 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 some of these some of these cases that are sort of somewhat miscellaneous and and didn't uh didn't really fit into a particular uh thing so total operating expenses there of thirty thousand two hundred ninety two dollars and nine cents so the uh the note from the balance the uh, that net profit there is the same as the closing balance as at the end of the year because this is the first year that we have operated under so we started with a with a zero balance there and uh, we've ended with that $13,937.77. So that is the, um, that's the general rundown um, of the finances at this point. Um, I am always available at uh, treasurer at fusionparty.org.au or just michael.morosky at, um, at if anyone has any sort of further questions or would like to request anything about their own donations, um, or receipts or anything like that. I'm always available to answer any of those questions. Uh, and yes, if anyone would like to ask any uh, questions now, uh, that would be it for me. Actually, just a quick note. Um, there is also a separation just to just to note there is, uh, while there is this expenditure in this, this is this is also party expenditure, uh, and there is additional expenditure that candidates have made for their own campaigns that does not that is not uh, included as association expenditure. Um, so that would be that would be considered personal expenditure. That stuff will be included in say uh, in the in the individual candidate returns that have all been submitted, and I think may get made public in a few weeks. Um, so there are additional numbers around sort of things that we have done. Um, that is something that uh, maybe we'll put out some further information uh, about what we've done there. We do want to make sure we're transparent about all this stuff and, and whatnot. And it is also very important that uh, when you do donate and we, we, when we receive money, that uh, that you know that we are spending it in the right places that we're, we're that we are treating it appropriately. So uh, again, any questions on that or if you have uh, suggestions or would like to get involved. There's all sorts of those uh, decisions that um, we yeah, we are trying to be as careful and, and, and considered as possible. But if any, uh, the it's the, the more the more voices in uh, in, in, in this conversation, I, I think the better. Uh, and the more hands on deck for for planning and uh, strategy and and, and uh, what we do in the future, uh, the better. And that actually is where this topic is. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, a couple of uh, round of applause for sure. Um, any questions for Michael? That's a huge amount of effort, by the way. Um, was, Andrew, was it 19 candidates, did you say? How many candidates do we have? Yep, 19. Nine, 19. So Michael pretty much ran the financials for the election solo, um, working with all of us candidates, a whole bunch of whom, including myself, who had never been a candidate before, um, bugging him with questions left, right and centre, um, him trying to deal with the the new branch structure, um, which none of us had really experienced before. Um, so thank you very much, um, Michael, for for all that hard work. There was definitely a lot put into it, and um, those numbers they go to show what goes into an election, but also just in running an organisation at all. Um, so we do definitely need need funds to keep keep the lights on. Um, so to speak, I think I did a quick tally um, of what I could find information of from everyone's expenses through the election. And I think minus the AEC um, costs, which are $2,000 each, minus that it was around about $66,000 worth of expenses um, from what I could tally. Now there's a lot, and I think I'm probably one of those as well who was just spending on stuff because I didn't know what I was doing and then trying to gather receipts months later. Um, so there's probably some other stuff. Don't tell the AEC that. 
Um, but yeah, it's a it's a big cost running uh, running an election. I might just chip in and say that I think a spend of sixty thousand dollars is kind of a moderate spend for a major party candidate in one seat. So we do a lot with the amount of money that we have. That's why we're so reliant on volunteers. Yeah, there, there, we've we've often. Um at least in sort of previous years or the science party and, and, and what we've we've often done uh comparisons between the number of votes gained per uh per dollar spent for each uh for each time so i've i did a brief report on some of ours some of ours a little bit sort of a while back um in one of our monthly meetings but usually comparatively uh, obviously there's going to be diminishing returns on money spent and things like that in, in cases but uh the the the, the generally the votes we get uh, are significantly cheaper than uh, very, the major parties, and especially parties like UAP, uh, which spent which spent seventy one million dollars, I think it was, in the twenty nineteen election. Um, th those those values, I believe, still haven't been made public yet. So hopefully, in the next little while, we can start doing a bit more analysis on that, and um, and or at the very least, it should be interesting to see. Definitely, all very good information. Cool. All right. If there's no further questions for Michael, we'll um, we'll move on. The next um, next person I had on my list who's going to speak to us is our convener, Peter Johnson, um, who is our ACT representative as well. So president of the Australian Climate Change Justice um, Party. So, uh, Peter, over to you. Thanks, Roger. Good day, everyone. Uh, firstly, good to meet some of you, which I haven't met before. So it's nice to see uh, a range of faces from around the country. So my name's Peter Johnson. I've been in the role of the convener of the party uh, really since uh, we got our registration in our first executive committee meetings when we fulfilled our roles. I guess my report today is aiming to provide an insight into the journey uh, we've been travelling, not from the administrative perspective that you've already heard quite a bit about, and also the achievements that have happened uh, in terms of running the federal election and many of the other bits of information that have been passed over through to you. I guess my perspective has been to look at the party as an evolving political movement and what are the fragments and elements that constitute that to allow us to be uh, an effective political voice in Australia's future. I guess the first journey is, the first statement is to say, it's been very productive and going in the right direction from the beginning. Uh, on top of that, we're discovering the skills and talent across the membership. And I think I'm pleased to say there is actually some great talent and strength in the group to uh, form a voice that is innovative and future looking. There are some excellent people and. Again, personally, I'd like to thank uh, those that I've worked with on the executive committee because they've done an enormous amount of good work to bring together the fragments. So that said, I want to reflect very briefly for a few minutes, if I may, on our purpose and some of the role, our role in the Australian political landscape, especially the situation we're entering into in 2022. Um, look, most of you will be aware politics is difficult and the infrastructure needed to be a recognised political party, while it's very complex and uh, can take all sorts of journeys, it really is only a twofold process. It is recognition by everyday people in Australia. They need to recognise us, they need to know who we are, they need to see us, they need to know who we are and our name. And secondly, is winning the hearts and minds of Australians. So that's all that's needed to be a successful political party and a very successful one, mind you. But winning the hearts and minds of Australians is a very busy place, intentionally manipulated, causing mass confusion in the Australian political landscape and controlled by our mass media and controlled by key stakeholders in our society, including industry. So in this regard, my reflection 
in terms of their control is that their systems are failing. And I think we all recognize, no matter where you are in life, where you are in this country, the systems that we've relied upon from our government and the social infrastructure that we've been told will provide for us has uh, been failing now for, for, for a number of years, number of decades, and the long arm of governments ever increasingly in your pocket in uh, the choices you make in life and the options that are available to you. I say that because I see that trend continuing into the future. We've had our COVID upheaval, we've had uh, now mass inflation, and I see this trend not being relieved in the near future, I see it extending in many, many years into the future. And I say that because I see that as a great opportunity for a new political party, for our political party, to win the hearts and minds of Australians as Australians turn away from the mainstream, as Australians get disappointed that they can't pay their mortgage, that they can't buy their house, that they can't provide for the vision and the dreams and the Australian way of life they'd hoped for. So in that regard, Fusion has an opportunity, uh, not based just on our own skill and our own innovative thinking, it has an opportunity to bring to us those Australians that are slowly getting enlightened and moving away from the dogma of mainstream politics and looking at something else and not necessarily just a vote once every four years, but a genuine political paradigm, a social answer, some uh, social magic and social innovation and social thinking, whether it will help them reorientate their life for their own personal better future. So. I see politics very much not just a social or a community future, but I also see it as a personal spiritual future for people that seek to change their lives and find new meaning in their own lives. And in that regard, Fusion has that opportunity to bring those Australians towards us. So some of the areas that our greatest opportunities are, I think, as we emerge from our establishment stage, is to be a very strong political think tank on alternative public policy solutions across the failing social infrastructure that we see all around us, be it climate change, be it social equity, be it economic and industrial development, land management, our justice system. So we've covered off a lot of those. And uh, in our initial policy uh, uh, circuit of our policy platform for the federal election, now we've consolidated some of those with our value statements that Rogers uh, presented tonight. And we continue with our work on the principles and policies. And in that regard, our new policy working groups, really a group that you as members should be carefully thinking about to participate in. Secondly, I think uh, is our opportunities to start finding uh, stakeholders, organizations, think tanks, academic institutions that may not become our members, but are our stakeholders. We have great affinity with them. We want to learn with them. And we want them to use us as their political voice, where they may be hampered uh, politically to exchange their views and ideas. And thirdly, I think we have a really genuine uh, challenge to learn how to be a, a good opposition. You know, we will not have a majority in Australia's parliaments for some time, but to get there, we need to be an effective opposition, which means we need our spokespeople on different policy platforms to be uh, heard, to have a platform in the social media, and to be articulate in our vision so that they can win the hearts and minds of Australians. That said and done, I think there's some, a few things to do for you as members to help us get on with that journey. Um, one of the things that uh, we are looking at, of course, it's already mentioned, is the working group uh, on, on policy, and there'll be other working groups being formed shortly after the AGM, I expect. We, we sort of put them on hold while we went through our value statement at the end of last election, but they're resurfacing and they're a fruitful space for you as members to be involved. Um, and I don't mean seriously involved in lots of work and lots of sort of frustration or lots of time. I mean, just genuinely as a bit of either lighthearted entertainment or a bit of uh, articulate, intelligent thinking with peers that are thinking along the same, same lines. It is a bit of fun, and I encourage you to sort of bring that into your life. The second thing is the alliances need to be forged. You know, we all move in very different networks. You know, you may be part of the Tuba Players Club or 
or the local triathlon or whatever may be the case. But there's many other networks that you belong to that Fusion needs to align itself to, not only to understand what they do, but where our alignment of policy is, but also to communicate with them. So members are our tool to be able to uh, access, you know, if you've ever been on LinkedIn and you've got LinkedIn connections, well, just think about all the networks that you have available to bring into Fusion. And we want to find the mechanisms to achieve that in the, in the short term. And uh, finally, I guess I want to let you know that we are actively looking for candidates. New South Wales have got local council elections coming up. The Victorians have started off with the state election. There's ACT elections coming up. This is all about presenting you as members and as our candidates to the Australian electorate. So uh, I guess I'm saying to you, pull your socks up, get involved and share your political voice and use Fusion as your conduit as your channel to do that. That's why we've established the party, to let you express your political voice in a formal, professional way. And I must say, with the team that we've been working with, they are exceptionally professional. I found them articulate and very responsible people. So there's a very strong foundation to our political party in Australia. So uh, that's, I guess, my last statement, which is to appeal to you as members to help in building the party because it is only going to be built with when our membership doubles, good triples and six doubles. And that's our core focus, I think, over the next 12, 24 months. That said and done and aligned to that is uh, considering really how do we make it easy for Australians to recognise us, to have affinity with us, to uh, utilise their current social paradigms and their morality to support a political party being innovative and forward thinking as we are. And in that regard, we are going through a process through the executive committee that's approved to review and assess the name by which we choose to align ourselves with. Um, I have a process that's been approved by the executive committee. And Roger, I'd like to put it in the chat and circulate a document now, which advises everyone formally of the commencement of this process. Um, I'll drag it and I think it's being sent now, uh, uploaded to the chat for everyone to take a look at. I imagine we'll circulate it shortly after this meeting as well. Um, look, I'm an advocate for evolution and growth of our party. And I really do think it's not just about us being better and trying to achieve what we want to achieve. I think in due course, we will have a substantial of, amount of support from people turning away from the mainstream status quo. People are looking to find meaning uh, philosophically, emotionally, morally, and I don't see any of the other major parties able to do that. Even our closest uh, party that could be recognised as a major party, the Greens, are very socialist orientated in their agenda and the way that they're approaching their politics is a very different version of sustainable development than the version that I've heard over the last 12 months. So very proud to be involved and look forward to working more, with more of you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. That was, um, that was really well, well said. Uh, and yes, we, we will definitely um, circulate that document um, after this meeting as well, we'll send that out to, to our members um, and we might even I'll put it up on the website um, so it's available for members to, to have a look at as well and to get involved with. So there'll be more, more communications as that, that comes out. Um, we might even speak to it a bit on Wednesday at the upcoming monthly member meeting um, just to go through a bit of that that process. And of course, uh, if anyone wants to stick around at the end, we can start to look at it um, as well. Uh, while we're here though, does anyone have any questions for Peter directly before we move on? Going once, going twice. All right. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Saha to speak on behalf of her, her role um, as engagement uh, officer. Thank you. Um, 
So I was um, assigned being engagement chair or engagement officer in July this year. Um, so it came about because I had a strong push um, to drive and define how Fusion engages with its own members and externally with um, other orgs, individuals and parties. Um, so what's involved in um, defining how we engage is looking at how we engage with our own membership, onboarding, um, running events, and also just managing volunteers and the activities that we want our volunteers to do. So there's a lot there starting since July. Um, so since campaigning uh, in the federal election um, and having that experience from pretty much March to May, being on the ground, uh, speaking to the public, uh, communicating the message of what fusion is and things like that, um, I found really the need to have a team behind our candidates, or at least, you know, um, to have a team behind the activities that we want um, Fusion to put out there. So because I want our party to be active, I don't want us to be waiting until the next election before we start saying hi to people and start um, having our hot takes on political topics. We need to always be visible and present. Um, and one thing that um, that worked for me uh, is I'm quite new to politics. I only came to the science party in 2020 after I saw what was happening with the bushfires. But what really got me over the line after signing up and getting involved more with the party was when um, the director of the science party, Andrea Finno, uh, called me. And so I think he had sent me an email or two asking me, you know, for a little bit of in information. But when he spoke to me on the phone, uh, and then, you know, suggested I speak to Andrea about how I'd like to get involved. That just blew my mind. And so since then, I had been sitting with the Science Party Weekly and, and got to know the people at the party and understand that no one's really forced anyone to turn up. Um, so the people who are actively involved in the parties were people who um, really just had an interest in seeing the world be a better place and really took their own time to understand how things work and understand more about different possibilities and solutions to um, how to make Australia better. Because we do all have that right to access politics and democracy. Um, so I don't really know how to summarise this, but I will. Um, I think what I really want Fusion to do is to be engaging with the public because I want to encourage accessibility um, and ease for the public to engage in the structures of democracy. Um, so that will in include, you know, actively engaging our members, actively in engaging with the public um, and also doing education campaigns. So I'll just rattle off a few things that um, we've been up to since July as engagement. Um, we've had over 300 new members sign up to Fusion, um, especially around the election period because people saw us on the ballot and looked up what our policies were and they really resonated with them. So what I did um, with a, a group of people as well, so I'll give them all a shout out. Um, we had Aidan Davies, Matt Washer, Wade Johnson, um, Matt McMillan, Simon Neeslaw and Adam Woodings all pitch in to um, call our new members and have chats with them and understand, you know, what drew them to Fusion and what do they want to see Fusion do in the future. Um, a lot of them were saying they really appreciated that Fusion stands for um, evidence-backed policies and they really fight for transparency and holding others to account. Um, and also, it seems like our vision for Australia wasn't focusing on things like taxes and petrol prices. We were looking further into the future and really uh, just embracing new ideas um, and also finding implementations for those new ideas. We weren't just throwing out slogans like we saw UAP um, saying their 3% cap on mortgage um, interest rates. And it's just, what? <laughs> so that's going to appeal to just a small group of people um, who are buying houses. Uh, and there's no way they can even do that. So it's just um, a piss take party, but um, we are not like that. 
So yeah, I'm focusing on engagement, focusing on engaging the public. Uh, I've written here, avoid ranting. Um, uh, another thing is, so as well as calling our members, um, I really want there to be a community in Fusion. So, you know, it's really easy to um, access our members, uh, get volunteers out on the ground and volunteers to feel supported and informed to know how to represent Fusion. So we've set up a, a fortnightly um, hot takes chat on the Fusion Discord. So it's just allowing another avenue for people to talk to each other and share ideas. And it's been really good. We had um, um, me and Michael, we're already brainstorming a, a website or app for Fusion. Um, Millspec introduced us to a calendar he was tinkering with, which I thought was so cool. So we're developing more of those types of opportunities with Fusion to just inter, um, to just uh, interact with each other. Uh, and we'll have more in real life events as well as um, we get back to normal. Um, so that's that. We've also had an idea to um, launch a Fusion podcast, but I think one thing that I'd like to stress, and it's funny because my role is to really uh, engage our members to uh, recruit volunteers and volunteer activity, but um, I really need more help with finding volunteers who are willing to donate their time. Uh, just a little bit, you know, I'm not signing you up to anything, um, but if people are interested in getting involved in policy development or lending their voice to a podcast or just anything, let's start the conversation because um, I really would like Fusion to grow and be thriving and to be really interacting with Australia and not be just a party on the ballot paper. Thank you. Thanks, Saha. Yeah, I think that's um, that's really important that we continue to be an outward looking um, political party with our communities and not just become like this niche social club um, where we're all capable of talking to each other about things, but but no one else hears about us. So that's um, that's really good. Uh, really good topics there, Saha, and that's um, a, a big call out for for all of our members to contribute um, across all the the different areas that are that are happening. Um, we definitely do have a lot of a lot of cases where it's a few people doing a lot, whereas it would probably be better off if there was a lot of people doing a few things. Um, so if you've got any uh, spare capacity to get involved, definitely reach out. Um, any questions, comments directly for Saha while we're on it? Cool. All right. So that uh, concludes the section that we had earmarked for report backs, um, unless anyone else wanted to speak up. Um, our next section, we're going to go on to motions. Um, given that we don't have quorum for this evening, um, we won't be able to go through all of them. Um, so there's a couple that would be more formalities for an AGM that will hold off until our adjourned meeting in a fortnight's time. Um, so we would typically approve the minutes from the previous meeting, which was our SGM in April. Um, we would accept the financials. So the statement of, of our financials that Michael presented as well. Um, so I'll put those off until a fortnight's time. We can go through there, but we've definitely got a lot of information out of, um, particularly from Michael's segment there. The next piece, which is also a motion, um, but I will bring it up in case there is some discussion. Anyone wants to um, talk through things is the constitutional amendments. Uh, so this is a special resolution um, required uh, legislatively to go out to all of our members, make them aware that we are proposing some changes to the constitution. Um, now we did some changes in April. That was the primary reason for the special general meeting in April. And that was to make some, um, what we viewed as 
necessary changes before the election kicked in. Um, we've got some more changes through this time. Uh, if anyone's had a look at the summary of changes that uh, was linked in the invite, you'll notice that a whole bunch of the proposed changes are actually just updates to reference numbers and some grammar um, grammar things because I missed them in the last update, so sorry. Um, but there are some, some more significant items in there as well. And as a heads up, because we're still in a very foundational position, even though we will definitely be progressing with a lot of the more interesting parts of being a political party, there are likely going to be a lot of constitutional changes over the next couple of years. Um, the constitution at the moment was, um, was fit for purpose for the original group um, that we that we inherited as part of fusion and um, there's been generally the consensus that that it's quite lengthy and um, hard to navigate uh, now that's no fault of those who put it together well who brought it to us it's probably the fault of those who put it together because it's mostly based off of the um, off of the model rules of the presented by the um, have who are they consumer affairs victoria uh, so there will be some further changes going forward but we do have um, some ready for acceptance in this round uh, is anyone interested in going through any of those changes or are you happy with reviewing those externally before the uh before it goes to vote so it'll go to vote again in a fortnight's time Would there be, um, are there many to go through if we went line by line? Oh, I should have counted beforehand. Good question. I think there's probably about a dozen or so chunky changes. I can bring it up and we can just do a quick scroll through. And if anyone's got any questions on them, you know, stop stop us uh, otherwise then there's a few comments saying that we'll review offline so i'll i'll do a quick screen share yeah uh it's fine constitutional constitution changes i think it's this one put a link in the chat as well but good to share uh, awesome thank you This one. All right. So, uh, can everyone see the screen? Screen there. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So, um, I'll run through them very quickly, uh, just top to bottom, and then call out if you want to go through um, any of these here. So, the first one is adding a section under name. Um, calling out what the association used to be called. Uh, now this is this is one I actually added after Michael and I went through weeks and weeks and weeks of trying to get a new um, bank account set up under the existing um, association's account because we had no official records of a name change even though we had all of the official records of before and after the name change, there was nothing that actually said that the association changed names. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that's just a quirk of the bank that we were using, um, but nonetheless, I figured why not chuck in a line in there that said what we used to be called. Um, so that doesn't change anything for the current name. It's purely just a reference point. Uh, next item is uh, for resigning as a member. So we have a provision to contact a member um, or for the secretary to contact a member. And if they don't respond within three months, um, then we can remove them as a member. Now, it's really important 
for us as a political party to be able to maintain um, a register of active members. Um, it not only helps with making sure that we are targeting the right people to get quorum for meetings such as this, um, but it also gives us a realistic view of what uh, numbers we're going to, to hit one, if we're trying to get registration uh, either at a federal or at a state level. Um, so this doesn't change the premise of the rule. What we're looking to do is reduce the time uh, allowed for the response from three months down to 14 days, down to two weeks. So essentially we'll be able to send a, a request or member to confirm that they still want to be a member. If they don't respond within two weeks, then we'll remove that membership. Um, this will also um, be applied at an automatic level. So at the moment, um, the system's not set up that way, but we'll look to set up for automatic renewals or automatic requests for, um, for renewals so that people keep us up to date whether they want to continue being, um, being a member. Oh, if I can just mention on that one, there's no, um, that doesn't imply that there's any penalty if someone doesn't respond in two weeks. And if they were, you know, traveling overseas for that time or whatever, they can just sign back up when they do get around to checking their email. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good point. Yeah. Apart from things like quorum, it would be, the Australian Electoral Commission will check that we have 1,500 members in between each election, so they will probably be calling us up next year. And, yeah, we just need to know that everyone on the list of names that we submit is happy to be a member to the extent that when the AEC calls them up, they'll say, yes, I am a member. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and being able to contact members... Um, is is an important way for us to to do that. Um, we do find sometimes that members will sign up, but then uh, unsubscribe from all of our emails, which makes it really hard to target the whole group as a whole um, to get notifications out. So we actually have a requirement to target all of our members for things like AGMs. Um, but then if we know that the AEC is going to be doing one of those checks, we will generally let our members know and make sure that they're ready for that call. So um, having them unsubscribed is not helpful and allowing us to control that a little bit finer um, will be definitely beneficial. But of course you can always talk to Saha, get on the engagement team and we can call all those people anyway. Go team. All right, um, rule number 19, grants for taking disciplinary action. These look very much the same. What did I actually change here? DRC is an operation. Fusion in oh, yeah, okay. So that's probably not a hugely significant one. Um, fusion DRC. Yes, it is the Fusion DRC, um, but this is more at an association level rather than um, at the party level. So just proposing to remove fusion. DRC still stands. So DRC is the dispute, dispute resolution committee. Probably good to remove any unnecessary instances of the name as well to future proof it for name changes so we don't have to find and replace too many if we change our name. Yeah. Absolutely. Otherwise, we'll be having more of these sessions going, going through. Spent many hours trawling through this. Uh, constitution. All right, uh, rule 22. Um, uh, sub rule is mostly a duplicate of sub rule five. Oh, yes. Uh, so this is actually a duplicate of sub rule five, except it doesn't make a great deal of sense. Uh, if a recommendation by the DRC, and then there's a gap, the committee must vote. So uh, rule number five in the constitution is the full version of this. I've forgotten exactly what is missing in the gap, but that is um, purely a duplication and actually fixes a 
numbering reference later on because I was trying to find where something linked to for ages and it didn't make sense, but it does if we remove that. Uh, 45, composition of the committee. Um, da, 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 da. So the current is at least one branch representative. Um, proposing to change that to up to one branch representative. So this way it makes it a little bit more even. Originally, um, this was, and also with the removal of Jay, the additional uh, branch representative, the intent there was to allow for uh, leveling, I guess, across the different original branches uh, that join so that there's no one branch that has more people than any other branch. Um, in writing, it makes sense as a nice way to make sure that there's no attempt of one particular group to take ultimate power over the um, over the whole whole party. The practical realization of this is that the different branches will have different numbers of people based on how many people they have available and um, want to be involved. Um, so even with this rule in place, the party, the branch um, stacking, shouldn't use that word, that's used elsewhere <laughs> politically, isn't it? Um, the, the number of people pro provided for a branch has been fairly off anyway. So to make it easier going forward, uh, the proposal is to uh, essentially remove this leveling mechanism and present one um, branch representative specifically as the representative. So this doesn't then account for anyone who's in a um, elected position as an officer. Uh, any questions yet? Doesn't seem to be composition of the committee. Um, a couple of lines that were kind of redundant. Um, any members appointed under Rule 61, which is filling casual vacancies, if they're filling a casual vacancy, they're actually a member of the, the committee, so that doesn't need to be called out specifically. Um, Co-opted non-decision-making members, if any, may be appointed from time to time. This also, um, our committee meetings are quite open um, to, to the party. Uh, we probably don't advertise it as much as we could, um, but they are open for people to sit in and contribute to. The only difference is that you won't be able to actually vote on things. And this line is actually saying non-decision-making members anyway. So uh, it's a little bit redundant for how we operate um, the committee. Roger, can I bring attention to the most recent message in the chat? You can. What's the uh, message today? Let's have a look. Um, just a heads up, I only have half an hour remaining of the scheduled time for the meeting. I'm able to stay past. Oh, ah, right. Yep. No worries. Uh, we'll speed through this and then we'll come through. I don't think there's too much more after this. And we'll get on to the um, election pace because, Luke, you'll be part of that. Fantastic. Um, all right, so next piece, um, registered officer. So previously it said Federal Electoral Act. Um, I've just replaced that with the actual name of the act. Um, branches, sub rule. So um, at the start, the number for a branch was five. At the last SGM, we raised that to a requirement of 50. Um, but missed this particular rule, which was for disbanding. So basically we upped the rule to say 
a branch needs to have 50 people, not five, in order to be a thing. Um, and this rule is saying that if the numbers fall under 50, it can be disbanded, whereas it's currently set to five, which is really low. This brings everything in line. Um, everything else in my mind anyway, when I was running through them are fairly minor. So spelling, grammar and cross references, lots of numbers changed. If you would like to go through the constitution and double check for me, that would be great, but I'm not going to run through every single one. There are quite a few. Yes, I missed a lot last time. Ah, oh, that wasn't uh, you. That was the uh, constitutional committee of which I was a member. So it's uh, that was a shared responsibility. Thanks, Andrea. All right. Um, so we'll take that as having gone through. Um, what we'll do. There was one other item to discuss, but we'll move on to the elections um, and I'll come back and talk about membership fee. Um, but we'll move on to the elections mostly so that um, anyone who needs to drop off can do so. So at this point, um, we have a returning officer uh, from our dispute resolution committee who will formalize the proceedings. Um, obviously we're going to be doing this online, um, but this session will be good for our nominees to be able to present a short, short speech for themselves. Um, so Liam, I've got you on the hook for this. Would you like to take over from this point or, um, sure, can do. No worries. I will hand over to, uh, Liam Pomfrey. Is it Pomfrey or Pomfret? Pomfret. Pomfret, not French. Uh, Pomfret uh, to to facilitate this part. So I'll hand over chair to um, Liam. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, just to give everyone a quick rundown of the process here, we have six positions. Uh, that were up for nomination, the President, Convener, Secretary, Treasurer, National Campaigns Coordinator and Registered Officer. Uh, for four of those positions, we've received two nominations. For the final two positions, Secretary and Treasurer, we've only received one nomination. Uh, now, unlike with some of the uh, individual branches, we will still be having uh, an election for all those positions, including the ones that are not being contested. Uh, that is because you will have an option uh, in all these elections to basically say, uh, none of the above, search for other candidates. So uh, just because someone is standing uncontested does not mean that they are guaranteed to be elected. Uh, the actual election doesn't start until I believe uh, tomorrow, well, technically tomorrow, one minute past midnight. And then uh, I think it was said earlier that it's actually running for two weeks from today. Yes. Uh, so not two weeks from today, two weeks from uh, one minute past midnight tomorrow. So yeah, um, the election will be conducted using the OPA vote platform, I believe. Uh, so all members should receive an email. Uh, and I guess you'll probably receive that uh, either later today or at one minute past midnight. I'm not sure when the system sends that out exactly, but uh, you'll receive an email giving you uh, all the instructions you need on how to actually vote. Um, just as a word of caution, uh, because I have encountered this in the past with this platform. Uh, it is a good idea that you run this uh, perhaps in your secondary web browser, the, the one that you don't normally use that doesn't have all the privacy add-ons installed, because sometimes those can play uh, havoc with these systems. And uh, we do not want a case where your vote does not get counted for some stupid reason. So, uh, just be aware of that. It's 
only rarely been a problem, but we don't want it to be an issue. And uh, well, there, there's plenty of privacy paranoid people in this party whose uh, things could potentially cause a problem. So let's just hopefully avoid that issue. Okay, so that's all the preliminaries, I think, that might need to be said. So I think we'll just go straight into the uh, candidate speeches. So I guess I will uh, just go straight down the list uh, as they are on the website. So uh, to start off, uh, Sahar, who has nominated for president, would you like to uh, start us off with your speech? Yes, thank you. Um, so, like I said before, I've been part of the Science Party since 2020. Um, I've been heavily involved uh, in fusion as part of the Science Party executive um, and as a campaigner in the electorate of Reed um, and now as the chair of engagement. And um, I have a vision for a party that is active and engaged. And also, I really want the structures, the operating structures within the party to be quite um, nimble and streamlined. And from what I've observed um, of fusion to this state is, um, I guess, areas where uh, the engagement or the decision making, um, sorry, the executive and the uh, decision making process in the leadership of fusion can be improved and, and be more engaged. So as president, um, I will make quite strong and um, effective changes to the executive. Um, nothing major. I mean, it's, it's stuff that I've been discussing with the rest of the party anyway. But um, that's what I would be striving for. I would want to see Fusion being out there and active. And that's what I would be uh, spearheading as president. Um, but as well... My activities as president would heavily depend on having the um, involvement and support of the people around me. So I would really be, I guess, engaging with the people around me, getting feedback, giving feedback, just to make sure that we are working um, transparently and democratically in the decisions that we make. Um, that's, that's pretty much the spirit of where I'm coming from. Um, but I know that that's not really, um, I guess, giving specifics. So I'm happy to field questions if we're allowed to have questions. Uh, I think we are allowed to have questions at the end. Uh, I think we'll perhaps do that once all the candidates have had their speeches. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't want to be too long, so because I know we don't have much time. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Okay, uh, next up will be uh, Miles Whitaker, who has nominated for both President and National Campaigns Coordinator. Miles? Hi, thanks, Liam. The, uh, my video is disabled, so I'll ask Roger to enable that, please. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll say a few words. So. Most of you would have seen my name in some or other of the communications, I hope, in the last 12 months. Uh, to give a little background about myself this weekend, I'm just coming off a, um, maybe I shouldn't ask to have <laughs> start my video. I'm a bit feral right now. I'm just coming off two nights camping at a protest camp in the south of Brisbane here for uh, Indigenous activists. So when Roger opened the meeting talking about elders past, present and emerging. That's a, a living connection that I try to make with, um, with those, but also with other activists and community groups around Brisbane. And so that's kind of the background I'm coming from, uh, ex experience in activism, but also political organizing and a variety of other things as well. Uh, I wrote a few things in my application on the website and um, Everyone's free to go and have a read of those. I've written many things online. A little bit about my vision as well. But before I jump into that, I want to say a little bit about the work that I've been doing with Fusion. Uh, so as the president of the Pirate Party, I have been involved with them for a number of years. That was actually what I consider my first political awakening uh, when I was still in school. And 
so coming from that background, I've been involved in, in party-based politics for quite a long time and was one of the um, one of the party organisers who came together to help form Fusion last year and one of the people who helped bring that together. We, um, as Andrea and Roger covered a lot of the uh, a lot of the details of that merger, but what, what they didn't kind of talk about was how we almost immediately went straight into a federal election campaign. And there was a, um, we, we were all a little bit anxious about that and what that would mean. And so from my, from my part, I knew that there would be a lot of unknowns and a lot of things we'd have to figure out. And the biggest thing we'd have to figure out was how would we work together and in, in some cases, if we would even be able to work together, and I'm happy to say that we are able to work together quite well, and we learned a huge amount as well. And obviously, there was a lot of culture shock along the way during the federal election earlier this year, culminating in May. But in the months preceding that, we came together and put together a lot of, um, covered a lot of incredible ground and did some incredible things. And like Andrea was saying, it's a really uh, groundbreaking moment in Australian history. In, in the debrief from that federal election, I presented what I saw as my vision for where we should go over the following 24 months. And to, to summarize that, essentially, it was that we need to maintain, as, um, as I think uh, Andrew and Saha, the points they were making about, we need to maintain activity in between election cycles. And so my proposal was to immediately go into the state election campaign for Victoria and leapfrog from state campaign to state campaign, building up strength, maintaining activity, and keeping us on a campaign footing in time for the next federal election. So that doesn't give us a huge amount of time to rest and that's something I'm acutely aware of and, uh, and have been aware of, but at the same time, it also gives us the opportunity to build up campaigning experience, to mobilize members and volunteers and to build strength and, and amass that strength and that power. And so there's, there's always gonna be talk of what resources we have and how we can spend them efficiently but the flip side of that is that by participating in elections that is the single strongest way we'll ever grow and we saw big big spurs in membership during the federal election immediately after the federal election we've seen big jumps in membership during the Vic state election which is which is on november 26th and the lead up in the campaigning we've seen big spurs in membership there in victoria and so to me, it's not a matter of spending resources, even though it is a huge effort to run an election campaign, but it's a matter of utilizing our resources to gain more resources. And so building on that and that. And, and so um, for, for my background, I see campaigning as really the, uh, in, in some senses, the existential purpose of the party. We exist to engage in the political process. And that's not to say that there aren't very necessary things that need to happen outside of campaigning, but rather that um, campaigning is is our strength and it's also how we grow so the um the vic campaign started off uh, just like the federal election there's a weird sort of um a, a few things going on in parallel there so in the federal election we were coming together as fusion at the same time as running candidates for the vic campaign we are going for victorian state registration at the same time as trying to run candidates and so as uh, as Roger mentioned, we are probably not going to make state registration. There's a few reasons for that. Well, we're a little bit short on, num on numbers, essentially. Uh, but we are still going to be running candidates who have agreed to step forward as independents, despite knowing that it will be more difficult, but they're still passionate about that change. And so in, in the de debrief for the federal election, I had a very good idea of where to go following on from that. And the debrief from the Victoria campaign, which will be in about a month, roughly speaking, then I'll have a very good idea of where we want to go next from there. And, and so obviously the next steps for campaigning include the New South Wales campaign, the state campaign, of which we've got some members who are interested in running as independents. And then following that, there will be a Queensland state campaign. This is looking years ahead in the future. So the Queensland state campaign, where we will have a chance to go for state registration in Queensland as well as running candidates. So these are questions we need to ask whether, why and how. And we'll need to look at, again, just like in Victoria, look at the resources we have and how we can best utilize those to participate in those campaigns. So uh, the during the federal election, I acted as the national campaigns coordinator and supported the state campaigns. Um, we, as Andrea pointed out, we roughly maintained our results prior to merging. 
rather than um, sort of combining them and putting them all together. And so there's there's good and bad to that. Um, a lot of that, we discussed that in the debrief. And uh, I think on, on the whole, you know, like like good and bad, but we have to take these results and keep building on them as, as we go. So uh, I'm also currently working as the National Campaigns Coordinator. Um, I've renominated for that and uh, wearing a few hats here as well, nominating myself for president and I'll be supporting state campaigns too, um, potentially also acting as the Queensland State Coordinator or, or, or something such like that. So my my from a president perspective, my vision for what fusion okay. is. And Sorry, Miles, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I mean, Tyrone's mm -hmm. kind of ninjaed me in the chat here where he's noted that perhaps we do need a bit of a time limit for candidate speeches. Um, Luke James does actually have to drop off on the hour. So I would mm -hmm. like to give Luke an opportunity to have uh, his speech. Uh, Could I have 10 second. seconds to finish up? Yep, go ahead. All right, thanks very much. I'll I'll scrap the next 10 pages and, and get right to the meat of it. Essentially, my vision for Fusion during formation and, and which I've been developing and hope to continue to develop is that we are a syncretic intertwined series of movements, which um, the phrase has been coined, uh, a movement of movements. It's my vision for what Fusion can be, where our distinctive ideas together contribute in part to a greater whole. And, and so those individual passions drive us forward. Now, I'm quite happy to go wherever I'm needed, whether um, whether that's as president or as national coordinator or as um, working as a even just a campaign manager for individual campaigns. And so um, Luke James and, and Saha, who I'm uh, nominating against, are both highly skilled individuals and um, more than happy to work with alongside or under them, even though we do have different visions and different backgrounds and different experiences. Thanks, Liam. Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned, we will skip ahead. I mean, uh, Miles was also going for National Campaigns Coordinator as well as President, so moving on to Luke uh, works with that order as well. So uh, Luke, you have the floor. Thank you very much for that and thanks for the accommodation with the time limit there. Um, I will keep my uh, speech short and sweet, which is how I think campaigns management processes should be. Uh, we're still a small uh, organization and we should be agile and responsive. However, to date, we've had the tremendous administrative burden of merging the founding parties and arranging our structure, finding our values, that sort of thing. As campaigns coordinator, I would like to cut down on unnecessary bureaucracy around campaigns, establish solid campaign management and I'll target effective channels for utilizing our volunteer and financial resources, such as the current 13 odd thousand dollar surplus we have. I'll do this with a dual approach, firstly by standardizing the processes and timelines around campaigns uh, and campaign nomination, uh, candidate nomination, as well as providing targeted support to volunteers and candidates around their resp responsibilities to run effective campaigns. As a political party at the end of the day, I, I believe campaigning is the most important thing we do. It's how we connect with voters and affect Australian politics. And as a new political party, this is a critical time for building our brand and pushing a bad product is worse than pushing no product. We have to be quick and bold with our campaigning and aggressive in ensuring that what we put out into the world is going to promote and further our cause. Thank you very much for considering me for this position. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, given your time restrictions, I was going to leave all questions to the end, but uh, if anyone does have a question of Luke, if you'd like to ask them now while he's still here, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, I'm sure Luke would be happy to answer via uh, what a Discord or email, whichever is more convenient for you. Luke, very sure. briefly, I've got a quick question, if I oh. may. Uh, just Yep. A little bit about your professional background, Luke. Your... Sure thing. Um, I'll answer that question, but I'll just quickly answer Austin's question first as he got in first with the uh, chat there. Uh, it's just a short one. Uh, I think pushing a bad product is worse than pushing no product. Um, and Peter, to answer your question about my background. 
So I was with the science party for about eight years. I've run two campaigns of my own as a candidate and assisted with several others. I've been involved in policy development, social media management. Uh, I'm, I think organizational skills are one of my uh, strong suits. Uh, well, it's probably my, perhaps my strongest suit. Uh, in the past, I've worked in IT, I've studied physics uh, university, and um, I've also run a joint campaign with the cyclists in the past in Victoria in the double dissolution election. Um, so I have quite an extensive history of uh, teamwork, organization, and a variety of skills relevant to supporting the campaigns we'll be running. And then to answer Miles' question in the chat, um, I would certainly consider running in state election, state or federal elections in the future. It's ever been my first choice, but um, it's always been more important to me to uh, contribute to the cause than get exactly what we want. Um, I'm, uh, I've always considered myself more of a supporting role than a uh, a face or spokesperson, but um, you know we all need to be a bit uh, adaptable and flexible. And to me, the ideal way to support uh, the party and campaigns is about focusing on people and supporting what they need. Uh, I think people are what make everything happen in a in an organization like ours and most organizations for that matter. And uh, I think that. Uh, the things that are often lacking in a small political party like ours is that um, so much of us just don't really know where to, <clears throat> pardon me, don't really know where to start or haven't dealt directly with the kinds of activities we need to be doing to run an effective political campaign, whether that's uh, simple uh, timelines and deadlines, whether it's social media management, whether it's governance or dealing with uh, uh, state rules or government rules and organizations. Uh, these are all things that I've dealt with in the past uh, extensively and know how to support people and guide people through all these processes. Any other questions? Okay. Right, well, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, so we'll return to the regular order then, uh, in which case, uh, Peter Johnson, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, Hi. Hi, all. Um, effectively, um, I see a uh, need really in the convener role to uh, provide advice, guidance and support as we establish our, our party's uh, proliferation among the Australian political landscape. Now, effectively, that means making some of the right choices where we divert our resources. What are the critical issues? We can't do everything all at the same time at this early stage. And we've been chopping away at the most important things, which is our values, getting up and running as a campaign, clarifying the talent within our people, uh, organising a good governance structure, and I think that's working quite effectively. Um, it's slow, but it's not slow because of our structure or the intent. It's slow because of the number of people that we've been able to engage with the onerous tasks, and that's growing. So, look, my intention in um, applying or putting myself out there to continue in the convener role is to provide probably three elements that I see as critical, and that's in my statements on the website. Um, the first is continuing to work with the executive um, in a role where I'm fruitful in terms of the decisions that we make and participate quite effectively in that process. So I've been part of the executive for a little while and I try and make a contribution effectively where I best can uh, to make sure we don't divert or diverge or get into conflicts. And we've been working very well to date. Uh, secondly, I've emphasised today the need for that innovation and that really strong critical thinking about alternative policy decisions and alternative solutions to Australia's social challenges. 
I've been working in this area as a human ecologist for about uh, 30, 34 years and have represented Australia widely um, overseas, signed bilateral agreements with other nations, represented Australia to the UN in international standards development, um, a sustainable consumption expert appointed by UNEP uh, for the Asia Pacific. And I've also worked in the area of green bonds and green infrastructure. So I sort of bring a bit of a macro perspective to a national political party, which is, you know, the national economic stakes, the national political stakes, the national social justice stakes, at that sort of macro level and keeping a very broad vision to what we need to address for the nation. So I'd like to focus more on policy that is very innovative and challenges mainstream solutions to our problems. And I think the third element that I'd like to uh, develop over the next 12 months, if I choose to be elected in this role, is to forge alliances at all tiers of society, be they from local groups, be they from state organisations or federal think tanks, academic institutions, to bring more strength, cultural strength and alliances with our party. So that's probably the three main focus that I see as critical. Effectively, I'm a member of a team and I do enjoy working with the people involved at the moment. So thank you, hope you consider me. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Peter, of course, standing for the position of convener. And uh, the second person we have also standing for convener is uh, Wade Johnson, who I have no idea if there's any relation to there, but uh, Wade, are you here? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Okay, the floor is yours. Yeah, sorry, I can't get my video to work. I'm just on my phone and my Wi-Fi is not great. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Wade Johnson. Um, I've been part of the uh, Science Party and now Fusion uh, for a couple of years. Um, just some background on me. Um, I, I'm a working scientist um, and I've been uh, got a major in chemistry. Um, I ran as a council candidate for the Science Party uh, in last year. Um, had a lot of fun doing that. And um, you know, in my spare time, uh, I play hockey and I coach um, kids. So that's just a bit about me. Um, sorry, I wasn't really prepared for this. Uh, here we go. So um, I'm also I'm an active union member. Um, I've been involved in um, negotiations between workplaces and the bosses. Um, and here we go. So, sorry, is my mic still working? You were cutting out a bit there, but it is still working. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So basically what I'm going to bring to the party uh, is um, professional negotiation skills, um, uh, membership growth, like the ability to grow membership, um, uh, actively participating in meetings um, I, and um, making sure I'm on time and uh, <laughs> using, using my position to actually uh, help the uh, executives in their mission to uh, unite the party instead of uh, a group of separate individuals. We actually can become a uh, fusion of ideas. Um, and yeah, I think that sort of sums up what I'm about. Uh, any questions? Well, we will come back to the questions at the end. Uh, we only did Luke's early because, of course, he had to leave early. Um, okay. So uh, is that all you wanted to say right now? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Well, thank you, Wade. Thank you.
Uh, next up, we have Andrea, who is standing unopposed for the position of secretary. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, yeah, I'd, um, I meant to give uh, thanks to everyone who put their um, their confidence in me for the position of president for the, the start of Fusion um, late last year. And uh, I hope you put your confidence in me for the role of secretary for the coming year. So um, I've been a member of the Science Party or originally it was the Future Party since uh, 2015. And the role of secretary involves a lot of uh, interaction with the Australian Electoral Commission. One of our challenges that we expect to come up this year is maintaining our registration through uh, showing, demonstrating that we have 1,500 members. Uh, so I've been through a, a few of those membership checks and the Future Party and then Science Party uh, successfully went through those. And we did the same with uh, Fusion um, with the increased membership requirement of 1,500 members. Um, so I am also familiar with the, the way we manage our membership database, which is a big part of being secretary. And uh, hopefully you've been happy with the some of the communications that have been coming out of Fusion. I think there's a bit of synergy between uh, communications and the secretary. Ultimately, I don't want to hang on to the being the chair of the communications committee um, when I'm also the secretary. So I'll be uh, hoping to find someone who's keen to move into that role if I'm elected as secretary. But um, I do have the capacity at the moment to do both until we build up the comms committee. Um, I think that's probably it, but I'll await your questions at the end if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, next up, we have uh, Michael Maroske. Apologies if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Uh, Michael, who's uh, standing unopposed for the position of treasurer. Thank you, Liam. Um, yeah, Maroske, Maroske, it all, it all works. Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah, so I've, uh, my name is Michael Maroski. I've been part of the Science Party since probably around 2015, 2016. Um, and then Fusion, uh, I was part of the uh, major process as much of the people here, uh, most of the people here were, and I've spoken, uh, were part of the merger process earlier this year. Uh, um, I have been the treasurer of the Science Party, um, or oh, I was the treasurer of the Science Party for a while of that uh, for a number of years, and uh, was was elected the um, the at least interim uh, treasurer of Fusion uh, up until today as well. Uh, I am a software engineer um, by trade personally, but um, but I over the number of years I've become intimately familiar with the processes and uh, requirements that are involved in from a financial aspect with a political party. So uh, I have uh, I have access and and all of the things set up to, to actually do the work for um, the, the bank accounts and and all the financial procedures within the party. Uh, but I am also relatively familiar with uh, all of the requirements and uh, all those things. So there is a pretty significant um, bit of administrative load. Uh, it's it's effectively akin to a bookkeeper for the most part, but there are certain compliance related tasks and and knowledge that is required of the role um, that I am pretty I'm generally really confident that I am uh, suitable for. Uh, I'm I'm very happy to continue to uh, to to be doing this role. Um, there is and it kind of relates to the rest of the party, also the rest of the roles uh, that we're talking about. Um, there are various administrative roles and various tasks that a particular role requires, but all of these roles do also involve a, uh, a, a vote on the executive committee. So it's important to consider everyone, including myself, as uh, someone who is able to uh, make decisions and uh, operate for the, the, the party at large. Uh, and I do believe I, I have that as well, having been uh, involved with Science Party for a number of years and fusion through uh, all of the administrative processes as well as campaigns for quite some time. Uh, I believe I have 
a relatively level-headed approach to most things, uh, most of these kinds of things, um, sort of big picture and, uh, and, and, and holistic views of, um, of these kinds of things. Where we, um, in terms of the future of the party, uh, I'm strongly of the belief that um, establishing our identity and brand and messaging uh, as well as the sort of the government governance structures to uh, to support that are the most important thing. So building a foundation to uh, from which we can grow and and create big messages, uh, create sort of uh, create and promote our our, our message. Um, campaigning is very important and all that kind of kind of stuff. But uh, but we need to know where we're doing it from, and we need to know and we need to be able to make the public aware that. Uh, we have a consistent message and we are sure about ourselves uh, before we can actually um, uh, sort of yeah, promote those messages. So uh, yeah, for the most part, from the treasury perspective, I am happy to continue doing this, this sort of stuff. There's, there's certain things that could be done um, delegated to uh, people more uh, skilled from the accounting perspective. We have a few volunteers that have put their hand up that have been really lovely. Um, I won't mention any because they haven't, uh, I haven't asked if I can, but um, that, that there's some people with some skills that have been very, very helpful with that. So I appreciate all of that, uh, but I'm very happy to continue uh, the, this role as, uh, as, as, as we go forward. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, for the last position, we've already heard from Wade. He, uh, he's standing for both convener and registered officer. So uh, the last person we have to hear from is uh, Owen Miller. Uh, Owen, are you here? He is not. Owen is not here. Okay. Well, in that case, we have actually heard from uh, everyone who is here today. So uh, I guess we'll open the floor for anyone who has any questions of any of the candidates uh, and I guess we don't really have a specific time limit on how long we go with this so uh, I guess we'll just go until we have no questions and then uh, what do we have after this uh, is it just general business after this Roger yeah that's right so we'll we'll just circle back and on any other questions from throughout the day or general business. So okay. this can go for as long as we need to. Okay, perfect. So, uh, well, the floor is open. If you have a question, please, uh, for the sake of the candidates, probably easiest if you write it in the chat. Uh, if you don't have a keyboard, then uh, maybe uh, put your virtual hand up and uh, we can, uh, go to you for a, a voice question. Thank you, Michael. So, uh, No, that's not Michael, our candidate, dropping out. That's a different Michael. But... And Michael M as well. Yes. Uh, at this point, it doesn't look like there's any questions. And a few other people are having to go. Ah, OK, we've got one. Uh, well, this, this seems more statement rather than a question, but uh, Austin asks, uh, seems to me one major difference between Saha and Miles is that Saha wants to focus on internal party structures and establish nimble decision making, whereas Miles wants to focus on external visibility through campaigns. Is that right? Uh, Miles, Saha, is that how you see yourselves? Hello? Hello, Saha, we can hear Oh, hi, sorry. You're lagging a bit there, Saha. I'm happy to address that. Um, I don't know if you were in the meeting. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, Just sorry. I know my, my internet's a bit unstable right now. 
Um, I'm happy to address that. I'm not sure, if, uh, Austin, if you were there earlier in, in the meeting tonight, but um, I was talking about uh, my role as an engagement chair and I'm really focused on uh, internal engagement with Fusion, so making sure that we have a really good membership community happening here and uh, a ground develop a ground force for our volunteers uh, and our future campaigns, um, as well as external engagement. So the way that we um, engage with members coming in, so how we onboard them, um, how we speak to other organisations. So. I have a vision that um, fusion is constantly in fusion with new ideas and developing and iterating its policy. So, I mean, I come from a, um, a and, um, and lately I've been working very intensely with Agile and that's really influenced with how I see um, the best way to interact with the world around us. And I think what that means is um, fusion or generally just to be, uh, I guess, relevant and cutting edge is it requires you to be open and collaborative and fusion is come together. And what we need to continue to do is to pull all those pieces together and be refining our policy to be something that um, matches what everyone agrees with and is what relevant is relevant to current times. So I think I didn't go into too much detail about how I want to see fusion to work in the future, but it is one that it is uh, quite heavily engaged externally. Um, that might not have come across in my two minute speech earlier. Uh, there was one bit where you crackled out there uh that might be good to clarify when you were saying you come from a oh okay um i used to be a pharmacist now i'm a business analyst in it projects so i work in a lot of uh improvement and transformation type projects um heavily in clinical software for doctors and pharmacists and nurses uh and lately for um my gov um so in that role, I'm working quite intensely with Agile, a methodology for um, just project and, and software development. And what it really requires is a lot of, um, I guess, being quite nimble and allowing a lot of open collaboration. It's, um, it's fast moving and it's really just, I guess, very open um, and, yeah works together with other people to, to get to a, a position that is relevant to current times. You know, it's not like traditional projects where they set a scope, you know, six months before, and even though the environment changes later, they're not strapped to that previous idea. So Agile is constantly improving and constantly staying up to date. Um, and that's what I see Fusion doing. Fusion is constantly... Uh, in motion and agile and nimble and it's taking in ideas from you know the the former branches um, and is constantly refining those ideas together to create fusion um, does that answer it that little bit I think so thank, thank you, you. Uh, Miles thanks the uh, that's probably a good summary of where our focuses in fusion have been so far but as Saha said uh, it's kind of ironic that each of us running for president wants to put more time into the other one so so Saha wants to think more uh, or, or at least put, put some time into working externally and myself with a lot of time working externally want to think about doing some internal work as well so um, I, I echo what Saha is saying about working agile uh, stripping away bureaucracy and streamlining our processes to make them more efficient. So part of the idea behind Agile is that you need you, you shouldn't be getting in the way of people doing what needs to be done. So we have what's called stand-up meetings where you, you'll usually hold them once or twice a day and everyone it's just it's a meeting where everyone's standing up and, and that's that's kind of it. So it, it heavily incentivizes you minimizing your times in meetings because no one wants to be standing up for a two hour meeting that sucks. No one wants to be standing for two hours. Like army, army cadets do it, right? But we don't want to do it. We're, 
we're, we're trying to change the world, change society, change government. So, so the incentive there is to let people do what they want to do. And that works really well in its tech and a software environment where you've got some incredibly skilled, brilliant people who are, who know, who know what they need to do, but maybe they need some kind of, uh, you know, a BA or a, um, a project manager like, um, like Roger or, or like Saha who can, who can bring those skills together and see the bigger picture. And so that's kind of what the president's role is obviously, obviously to see the bigger picture and bring together the people with the focus and, and the skills. And, and, and so where I see sort of my vision looking internally for fusion is by supporting participatory and direct democracy. And, uh, and that's, that's something that a lot of my background really speaks to. And I see this as both, both an internal and an external thing in a sense that we need to be transparent internally as a way to promote ourselves externally. If people can look in and say that, you know, we're, we're promoting transparent government and you can see us being transparent, that's powerful. If, if we say we want a government that listens to the evidence, listens to the science, and we listen to the evidence, we listen to the science and how we operate, that's powerful, right? Uh, that, that we're consistent internally and externally. It's like a, a way of being methodologically honest uh, as both like a value and a structural thing. And so, uh, and so if we can internally, if we can bring that sort of participatory direct democracy way of organizing, which, which, which sort of echoes some parts of Scrum, but also uh, like comes in a different direction where we, we're all essentially equal, right? We want to support equality in, in, in a sense where uh, I'm a firm believer that everyone is an expert in themselves and everyone knows how they want to run their life maybe like with, with some assistance from friends and family and community and, and so on and so forth. But ultimately everyone knows what they, what they, how they want to do the things they want to do, what they want to do. Maybe they need some help, obviously. And, uh, and so we shouldn't be uh, getting in the way of getting everyone's input and how to build a society for all of us. And so that goes for both internally and externally. If we can bring meth methods into government through our politics, through the policies that we advocate for and through the campaigning that we do, then uh, at the same time as modeling those internally, then we, we practice what we preach, essentially. Thanks, Liam. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have two further questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is really a quick yes, no question, I believe, uh, from Cami, again, for our presidential candidates. Uh, have you done a course or info session in board management and running meetings? I can answer that. Um, so I've been involved in many meetings, um, as in facilitating meetings, uh, working with um, C-suite people and the executive of many organizations where I've been implementing change and transformation projects. So I'm quite comfortable uh, facilitating meetings. Um, and I've also been involved in transformation of um, structures so if that's what you mean um, board management I'm not really sure what you mean by that but I feel very confident I can manage that if I could just jump in here thank you very much Saha it was just to say that you know there is actually a very tried and true formula that's been extremely well developed in how to run meetings and how to make sure your board is running um, with integrity and it's incredibly worthwhile doing if you're if you're going to take on this role, if you haven't already gone through some kind of online self learning thing, which doesn't even take very long, you will learn so much. I'm sure Roger oh, yeah. must have, and, and Andrea must have because they've always run meetings um, very correctly. <laughs> always happy to learn more. Great. Yeah, I so I, I gather what you're referring to here, Cami, are things like the formal uh, certificate in governance for non-profits from the Governance Institute and uh, things along those lines. Well, yes, the kind of training they receive, but I'm not expecting anyone to go out and make an expense and <clears throat> to, to achieve that because there's plenty you can do uh, without actually having to sit a certificate, but, <clears throat> mm. but just to make sure you, you know what the best practice available. Cammy, do you mean stuff like Robert's uh, Robert's rules or Rupert's rules, whatever it is? Robert's rules of order. Um, I'm not entirely convinced. I know what they are, but I actually have done a course. It was, in fact, really expensive, but it was incredibly valuable, and I did it with um, 
uh, governance lawyers. And, um, you know, once you've done that, you know exactly how to, yeah, you know exactly what's right and wrong. You never have to think about it or second guess it or ask anyone else. You just know what to do. And anyone taking on a position um, as um, president and, and leader of a board would benefit hugely and be very comfortable having this knowledge under their belt. As I said, I wouldn't expect you to have to go and pay for it though. Yeah, I haven't done anything formal like that. Um, I've done about a, a thousand and one agile projects and uh, I've done a huge heap of community organizing as well. So I guess I kind of come from the opposite direction of Saha where um, I spent time as a, as a workplace union organizer, for example, with, uh, with the Together Union up here in Queensland. I've been a, a community organizer with um, environmental groups like, uh, like the Wilderness Society. And uh, you know, I've done door knocking, I've done, camp I've done political campaigning. I've been about five or six campaigns. So I, I've led teams in, in that sense and done community organizing trainings in that sense where, where the meetings are, are less so about organizational governance and more about, so we've got a, a project or, or a goal to get through and, and we've got to work on that. And so for organizational governance, um, most of my experience comes from the uh, for, from being on the executive of the Pirate Party, the National Council of the Pirate Party for a number of terms and, uh, and, and also being on the executive of Fusion for the previous year. Sorry, I'll just jump in there, Miles. Um, you did say that your experience is opposite to mine. Um, I would just ask that um, don't speak for my experience without checking with me first. Um, because I have been involved in, you know, door knocking and quite direct uh, interactions with people in the public, if that's what you're saying, um, and have also developed um, a 1,500 strong membership um, of a group um, online since um, October last year, where it's a community where we share food um, and it's really just uh, a movement to prevent food waste and doing it in um, the most streamlined and, uh, you know, minimal coordinated uh, avenue of doing that. Um, so that's just an example there. So just please be careful when, you know, if you're comparing your experience with mine, not to uh, assume my background. Okay, so Austin's just pointed out in the, in all the example of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, their courses. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of organisations that do these kinds of uh, short courses. I mean, uh, honestly, I'm supposed to be doing one myself because uh, the, the new uh, the stuff the um, government's requiring for directors of non-profit organisations to have director IDs and to do a few things like that. So I might need to be doing one for the uh, Privacy Foundation. But anyway, uh, not formally required uh, for an organisation such as ours, but uh, yes, certainly a pertinent question to ask of our candidates if they uh, do have or would be getting those kinds of uh, qualifications, either formal or otherwise. Uh, we had another question here from Andrea, a uh, question for presidential candidates. Can you clarify what you see as the future of the branches? Uh, Andrea, I, I assume you're meaning the branches as in the constituent uh, the founding, parties. founding parties, yes. Okay, so uh, Saha, would you like to start us there? If, if I've, I'll just clarify as well, um, just for everyone's sake, that um, the, the founding parties have this formal role within the constitution as branches and, um, yeah, there's an administrative structure around them. Okay, and uh, so just to respond to the chat quickly, uh, Peter, I see your hand up. We'll come to your question next. So... Uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to speak to this. Yeah, so um, we've recognised um, we have structures in the constitution currently for the branches. So at the moment we have um, two representatives from each branch uh, have a position on the executive. So that means that, you know, they turn up um, every week. Uh, now it's every fortnight. They turn up to the executive committee meeting um, and they have to be there to ensure that we have quorum and then once we have quorum, then that's when we can start to, you know, pass motions and make decisions and things like this. Um, I haven't been part of the, the executive, but I come to the executive meetings because I'm quite keen. And 
we practice transparency that way. So, you know, anyone uh, in Fusion can observe the executive meetings if they wish. So I would go um, observe and I would uh, raise things that needed to be discussed um, by the leadership. Um, but I was quite disappointed to see that um, even when we had our meetings every fortnight, uh, people, it, it was a struggle for the people who turned up to the executive meeting to form quorum. So some of the executive uh, would eventually appear. Um, they would come maybe 20 minutes late, half an hour late. And so the rest of the executive were patiently waiting to form quorum. Um, some of the, so that's including some of the executive who are here now and, and have nominated themselves for uh, leadership positions. Um, I won't out who they are, but it's part of my campaign for why we need to stream down, slim down the uh, executive committee because we don't need to be waiting around to form quorum to be able to take action as fusion. Uh, and I think that's been a problem that's really slowed fusion down. And it's something that I've vocalized in a few executive meetings. Um, so what I see for the future with the branches is um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I honor the, the origins of where fusion has come from. You know, I came from science. I love um, what the pirates stand for. I mean, uh, before fusion happened, I knew about the pirates and, yeah, great party, um, fun name. And it's good that they stand for um, that freedom of information and, and digital rights and things like that. Of course, we need someone standing for that. Um, it gets a little bit tricky though with, um, I guess, wanting to see at the same time, maintaining structural identities in the executive where um, it seems like, some of the people from the former parties aren't really maintaining the same momentum or enthusiasm to be part of fusion. Um, and then as well, wanting to have a strong unified identi identity as fusion. So, um, I mean, even earlier today, we were having a discussion about maintaining um, registration for Science New South Wales. Um, and what was unanimous was, you know, we would like to have fusion go forward with a unified identity. So it wouldn't make sense ultimately, uh, even if people wanted it to have Science New South Wales remain and then also have Fusion New South Wales concurrently existing. So what I see is we have to honor and respect where we've come from, but going forward, we have become fusion. Um, and I think this is something that I'm working on well, and would like to work on behind the scenes, whether I become president or not, to really um, simplify and clarify how we uh, structurally accommodate the branches in the constitution, um, because I really want executive to not be weighed down so much. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that kind of answers it for me. Does that answer your question? Um, I mean, I think Miles, you're up. Um, and I'd also like to um, add a question for Miles to answer. So Miles, um, you're currently the president of the Pirate Party, and I think you're the, the state leader in Queensland. So if you were to become president, how will you um, see yourself managing being president of Pirates, president of Fusion and state leader? Because I know you're quite dedicated and quite heavily involved in Pirates at the moment, even now. As I said earlier, the idea of a movement of movements where a sense of ideas together, working together, each contribute to a greater effect is what I want to see. But going deeper than this. Uh, sorry, Miles, can you... Uh... Maybe bring that a bit closer to your mouth. We can barely hear you. Okay, so going deeper than the different ideas that the parties bring, I think that we're collectively defined by our individual passions. So for technology, science, secularism, and the environment. And as long as we have these separate movements within fusion, 
then each of those passions will drive fusion. And, and so we, we joked around a lot last year about how the two potential options for directions for fusion, one was the party salad with a, a delicious salad full of all kinds of different fruits and vegetables and a lovely fusion dressing or a kind of uh, uh, a, a bland soup where we lose all distinctiveness and there's just one sort of mix confused flavor of a thousand different things and so maybe part of that was the um was how we would actually what processes we'd go through to work out who we wanted to be and we needed to go through those processes we hadn't gone through those processes and and figured out a, a distinctive and unique and clear bit, um, brand and identity for the party going forward and so that's something that uh, has been begun by Drew Wolfendale behind the scenes and is, and is ongoing and will be ongoing and what I've seen from a campaign side is that we, after the federal election, we, we, we had to put in the mechanics to campaign and the organization to campaign. But what I'm seeing from the Victoria campaign is that it, the state campaign is that it's no longer enough to have those mechanics, but, um, but we also need to have the uniting vision and the uniting ideology, which makes people proactively want to seek us out. And, and so we, like we can we can go for one single unified brand but without something underneath backing that up to say why that brand is important and what that identity actually is beyond just a fusion it's <clears throat> it doesn't feel like there's as much there and so i've always campaigned and all of the pirates as well have always campaigned that our individual identities are what gives us strength and so i know members in science have always supported dropping that and uh, and, and science itself has gone through a number of rebrands. And so they're, they're okay with that and they're open to that. And in some ways that speaks to different culture, but the, the differences in culture between the parties are such that pirates always were coming from a place of cultural identity rather than, um, which kind of turned into a, a sort of unifying ideology rather than coming from uh, somewhere where the branding was less important than, than the politics and the ideology itself. And so for us, culture identity and brand were synonymous. And we've seen that and campaigned on that. And it's been incredibly successful in Europe. And while we haven't succeeded individually here in Australia, those passions which attract people to the pirates are one thing that gives strength to fusion. And so similarly with, with the secular party, people who are attracted to the idea of a secular Australia can now work on that and bring that passion forward within a broader platform. And same thing for Vote Planet, people who want to declare a climate emergency take action on deforestation, take action on the environment. And, and yes, they can bring those passions and that specific expertise. And I'm currently working with Andrea Otto in Victoria on a, a regional campaign there in the Murray Plains district, where we're looking at the massive flooding that's going on in Victoria. And that's something that, that takes both a local focus, but also a specific policy-based focus where she wants to campaign on deforestation, climate emergency, water rights. And those are things she's always cared about. And, and if we have a million things in our policy without people drilling down to those individual areas, those individual passions, which we can more effectively do with caucuses or movements or, or, or policy branches or parties within fusion, then I think that's the best path forward and the strongest path forward. Uh, Michael has noted there are unanswered compliance questions and significant bureaucratic processes that result from the existing branch structure. Yep, that's exactly right. And uh, as everyone else has also noted as well, we represent something unique in Australian politics. And, uh, and to me, it's, uh, it's regrettable that we want to put aside that uniqueness and that groundbreaking uh, identity story, which is, has power to it. That way we've come together and, and leave it in the past. Okay, thank you. Um... So, Peter Johnson, you had a question. You've had your hand up for quite some time now. Thank you for being patient. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, Saha did have that question uh, from Mars about juggling roles. Uh, so perhaps we might deal with that question first, then get on to your question, Peter. Each of us wears a thousand hats already. Um, most of us are in multi-role. Part of that is um, less volunteers at a higher at a, at a senior level with infusion and a mid-level with infusion, less volunteers than we'd like. And so taking on more roles than we like as a result. But I think it's kind of en en endemic in small party politics that we all get pulled in a thousand directions and, and it sort of works together to contribute in a few different areas. 
uh, given the choice, I'd sit in a sort of medium level working on campaigns and um, maybe even just focusing on individual campaigns. But as it stands, there's more things that are needed elsewhere. And so within the Pirates, my role is largely just to convene, uh, bring together existing people working on existing projects and uh, provide little bits of um, nudges to keep it all working in the same direction, which is pushing up fusion from the bottom. And, and so the policy stuff we're doing is feeding back into fusion with thanks to Tyrone and the comm stuff that we're doing with thanks to um, members like KJ and John August and others that's feeding back into fusion through Victoria campaigns or through national stuff. And, and so uh, the same thing for the state level organizing in Queensland, there's, there's been no, no pirate party meetings in Queensland since fusion. There's been fusion meetings in Queensland since fusion, which pirate members have gone to and science party members have gone to and, and vote plan members have gone to and so on and so forth. So can I just clarify that you are um, going to remain actively involved, continuing as pirate president um, and and even though Fusion President is quite an involved role, it's the most involved role, and we are a new party establishing our identity, you're going to be equally as invested in Fusion President. Yeah. Right. Cool. So can okay. I... Can I uh, yes, go ask... ahead, Peter. Sorry for hang on to your question for so long yeah no worries no worries thanks for time um interesting uh set of questions and debate but i've got a quite a different question for both candidates for the presidents and i'll paraphrase it by the continuing focus of the president being the image face and leader and determinator and, and dictator of all the mainstream parties out there. Australian politics tends to focus on a leader being the symbol of everything the party is and a lot of underlings underneath them. Fundamentally, the vision of the branches and the unification of diverse parties was to establish a political party which allowed grave diversity and the space for the very strong personalities that have an interest in politics. People in politics have strong personalities, strong vision, strong dogma and a strong perspective and a voice. And uh, to suppress that as the mainstream parties do, noting also the Greens has recently done with their, the way they sack their deputy president is a, a very big factor for a number of members of the Fusion Party. Now, constitutionally, the role of the president starts and stops at chairing the executive committee meetings. Now, there's been a high level of respect shown to our two former presidents uh, based on their calibre to um, guide the priorities. And both of them have very carefully managed not suppressing debate or not suppressing ideas and they've done that very very well so that's my my preface to my question my preface to my question is how do you see your role in the context of the constitutional limitation how will you facilitate equity within the decision making structure and the perspectives of this machine we're building called the fusion party Excuse my directness. Um, just so I understand your question, um, are you seeking how through the current structure of the constitution, are you asking how we can have, this is my interpretation, but are you asking whether we can have um, the, the most democratic uh, decision making for fusion? Well, I, I think that it's got to do with the culture of the president or the leader or the executive in terms of the culture, whether you we take a role of a president being um, the, the substantial influence, the determinant on issues, 
or whether the president is a facilitator of the debate and creates a culture of diversity and creates a culture of uh, empowerment. Oh, yes. um, leading you a little bit in, in, in the answer that I'm looking for, but I'm saying fundamentally, Australian politics and Western politics identifies with an individual being the embodiment of everything that a political party stands for. And uh, in many ways, the heritage of our party and the interest of the branches to allow diversity and uh, different personalities to exist within the Fusion Party has been predominant today. So I've seen, so I guess I'm worried about or considering or thinking about what is the culture of leadership you'll present, you'll offer to the party. Yeah, thank you. Leadership and the culture of leadership is something that's been um, a personal interest for me for a long time since um, I first entered corporate culture and, you know, the work, the office workplace. I used to be a pharmacist until about um, the age of 27. I entered the office environment and it was vastly different, but it really um, motivated me to think about um, the best way that groups can work together, um, optimizing the way groups work together. And then as well, what is it that makes a good leader, an effective leader, a leader that people respect and listen to? So I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, and I think one thing that I wanted to do um, as chair, engagement chair, was I really was looking to engage the executive. So when I noticed that the executive weren't coming to meetings or aren't, weren't coming on time and really delaying quorum to be reached and things like that, um, it really disappointed me and it pushed me to think, well, my role is engagement. I need to engage with the executive and get them back on track um, and one way that I think the president really needs to facilitate developing is uh, an agreed upon vision, a baseline vision. So one way was um, I was posing the question to everyone, you know, no one is forcing us to be here. This is a voluntary thing. No one is getting paid. There are no, um, you know, back end deals or whatever going on. We're all here because we're passionate people and we care about how we want um, democracy in Australia to function. And so I put the question to people, you know, why are we here? What are we doing this for? And um, as president, I would be facilitating that we refine um, everyone's uh, just answer to that question. And then what we'd need to do is we'd need to come to a shared vision. And I feel having a clearly defined and shared vision is where everything else flows from. So when we have to um, embrace uh, you know, new decisions or new problems, things like that, it always goes back to the vision. Why are we here? What are we doing this for? Um, and I think part of um, cleaning up the constitution as well will help us be able to address um, situations and issues that come up as well with a lot more freedom because we won't be, um, you know, uh, weighed down by all the minutia that in practice has turned out doesn't really work um, for fusion to function, e.g. having um, the two required branch reps on the executive and we're finding that the branch reps aren't really coming to the meetings, aren't really using the structures we've set up for them, like using their fusion email. We're having a lot of um, inconsistencies in communication in the executive. So we're, you know, we're having um, emails being sent to the executives, fusion emails, but then they're replying back with their personal work emails or their Gmails. And it's just, I think we need to get back to basics, back to the foundation of what we're doing here, what we want fusion to be. And we need to make sure that the executive is on board with that. So I think that's what I would introduced first as president. Um, and then I guess to answer the other part of your question, I think what you were, what I got from your question was you were asking, would I be facilitating um, or will I be like a dictator? Will I, will I be the one that sets the, um, the uh, identity for fusion and everyone else just has to follow suit? Um, I think there has to be a balance between that because the buck stops with the president. I think 
um, the success of the party is accountable to the president. So the president really does have um, a responsibility to represent the party well and to have that consistency and integrity in how they present the party. Um, and yeah, ultimately, sometimes they have to pull the trigger and make the hard decision when um, if the executive as a group is undecided. I hope that uh, answered the question. Thanks, uh, Miles. Well, I don't like I don't like titles, and um, I don't particularly want to be a figurehead. Maybe that's what's needed. In which case, great, sure. You know, I've done that before. I can do that again. But, but um, I, I see it as, as, as there being a sort of job to do. In in some of the movements I've worked with, we have the concept of a uh, a facilitator as, as a named role within meetings, where the role of the facilitator is to uh, essentially the role of the chair, but they don't necessarily dictate things, but rather they make sure that things stay on track and, and keep moving forward. And and so in, in the tradition that I come from, like it's, it's same, same, but different. We, uh, we don't really have that hard restriction on roles and titles and responsibilities, but rather there's people who want to say things and there's things that need to be done. And the focus is on getting people to say the things that need to be said and getting things done that need to be done and minimizing time in meetings. And so anyone who's sat through the uh, Pirate Party National Council meetings, which I've chaired for the last couple of last previous terms, will know that um, we keep very strictly on time to about an hour, a little about a bit over an hour now. And, uh, and there's a very specific culture that goes along with that as well. And so in the early days of fusion, there was a lot of cultural shock from other fusion members from outside pirates who'd come along to the National Council and, uh, and, and be like, wow, this is a different meeting to something I've ever been in before. But we get through things in an hour. We get the work done that needs to be done. And we have, uh, you know, we have some fun along the way and we get a good working environment together. And so that I don't intend or I haven't, I haven't tried to import that pirate culture into fusion more generally. Um, in, in some cases, you, you know, it's, it's happened anyway, which is always going to happen when you have different cultures coming together. And so the culture which I've always tried to encourage within fusion is supporting people to work on the mid-level roles that they need to do to support the party. And so for me, that's things like campaigning. For other people, that's things like working on comms or, or engagement. And, and so there's people who are better at nearly everything or, or probably mostly everything I can do. There's people better than me at doing it and they should be doing those things in, instead of me. And so in terms of being a figurehead, there's, there's many people in this meeting right now who would be better spokespeople than me and are better spokespeople than me we had fantastic candidates during the election some like um, andrew otto who i'm working with right now is very very passionate and devoted to her electorate and has incredible connections um from, from the science party wade johnson is doing some really exciting stuff at the moment in preparation for a possible uh council or state run in new south wales um, james haggerty i was incredibly impressed by during the election as well and so if if the role of the president is meant to be a figurehead then then fair enough you know that's what's needed and i'll do what's needed but i don't necessarily see it that way i think that like a facilitator as a facilitator you're there to facilitate things that need to get done and the role of the executive is to oversee the administrative function of the party we have legal requirements we have compliance and governance requirements financial reporting and uh, a, a lot of those don't that doesn't need to be done in meetings we know it needs to be done because it's written in the law and people like michael know it inside and out people like roger know it inside and out because and, uh, and myself, we know it inside and out because we've been reading these things over and over again, desperately hoping that we're doing it right. And we've done it right before. So, 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 so things like that, there's shortcuts we can take in meetings where we don't need to discuss these things. And uh, yes, to an extent, like it, it's a decision-making body, but I don't see it as like a body from which decisions emanate and then are dictated to the rest of the party, but rather it should be a coordinating body where the, the, the parts of the party that need to do the things they need to do get on and do it. And the executive just makes sure that those different things are ticking along. And so that's kind of the big difference between a, a, a more conventional corporate structure, uh, which is very strongly hierarchical and dictatorial, like many other parties are run. But I don't, I don't really like that structure. I don't think it's very participatory. I don't think it's very transparent. And I'm really disappointed by other parties who claim to be de democratic internally, but then run in these hierarchical dictatorial structures. And, and so to me, direct democracy means run by members from the bottom up. And so the executive needs to be encouraging that and coordinating that and being proactive about coordinating that. So the less time we spend in meetings deciding what decisions we're gonna announce for us the rest of the party, and the more time we spend in meetings saying, 
how can we get the party to make these decisions for us? There's more people making decisions. There's less burden on us. So like Roger said earlier on, more people work doing less, it's less stress and it's easier overall. Thanks, that's great. Yeah, thank you both. It's, uh, it's, it's a very important function as a growing party that we find the channels to grow and engage our members and harness the resources that they have um, and do that efficiently as well as, as uh, both of you have said. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you to all of our candidates. Uh, it is getting close to, uh, well, it's almost 6 p.m. here in Queensland. So we have been running for quite a while at this point. A number of people have already had to drop off. Uh, I, I think at this point it's probably best if we bring this segment of the meeting to a close. Uh, I believe uh, the room is going to be staying open for people who want to discuss general business. Uh, and I think if anyone has any more uh, detailed or specific questions for the candidates, uh, perhaps forward that to them via either email uh, or uh, I believe all the candidates or certainly most of the candidates should be on the Fusion Discord as well. So they should be uh, readily contactable there. Okay, so uh, I, I guess I'll pass this back to uh, Roger now then. and. Uh, Thank you, everyone. And uh, as I said earlier, the uh, you will receive emails uh, letting you know how you can vote once uh, this is all set up. Thank you, awesome. Liam. Thanks, Liam. Um, thanks for taking on that role as returning officer for us. It's really important to have someone who's um, not personally um, on the on the, the ticket to, uh, to oversee elections, uh, make sure that things are run smoothly and, um, and fairly as well. So thank you, uh, Liam. Yes, we will have those emails go out. Um, they should be all heading out hopefully by 12.01, as you mentioned, uh, tomorrow morning. So by the time everyone gets up, it should be in your inbox, assuming that the system works the way we think it does. And then we'll uh, we'll close voting just shy of that two weeks. So given that we're um, going to uh, reconvene this session in two weeks time, what was the date again? 6th of November, uh, we'll close the meeting on the Saturday night. So it'll be midnight Saturday night. That way we can make the announcements at the Sunday meeting. Uh, and thank you also to all of our nominees for those positions. Uh, being on the executive is definitely a, um, a, a an important role, particularly for a developing organisation. Um, we're still getting getting all the processes in place um, after coming together for for one year. Um, all right, so there was only one item that was on the agenda that I quickly skipped past to get to the elections. Um, and I'll use this to open up for general business because it would be a topic for a motion and we can't um, make motions in this meeting anyway, is around the membership fee. So the current executive has... Um, made a suggestion that would go to the member motion uh, to implement a membership fee. Uh, now the suggested fee would be $20 per year um, as an annual subscription. So new members would pay the $20 and then $20 each year from there. Um, this would go towards all of the things that Michael mentioned uh, in terms of building up a a kitty, like a, a war chest for um, for elections um, and for other other activities along the way as well. Um, I know Saha's particularly mentioned, you know, doing in person events and things uh, going forward as well. So, if those events are related to the party, 
Um, so they're not, it's not just throwing money at, um, at social get togethers and um, have a few drinks. It's, if it's related to party activities, then we could look at using using funds for that as well. It also has the added benefit of weeding out those who are less um, less interested in being involved. So uh, as a political party, yes, we need a certain number of members uh, to be registered. And the more members we have, the more uh, involvement we have, which is great. We don't need members, we don't need people to be members to participate. So we can definitely have supporters who are not members. Um, and if that's the case, you know, so be it. Um, one thing to note though, and I know was, was an important thing uh, a number of people brought up when we were negotiating around this was that um, obviously, you know, some people can't find a spare $20, uh, particularly at the moment, you know, cost of living is going through the roof and, and things can be really tough for people. So it's not going to be a mandatory um, membership fee. Uh, I think in, in all cases, you know, an exception can be, can be made for those who are, who are requiring a little bit of um, extra help. Uh, Peter, you've got your hand up. And you're on mute. Sorry. Oh, good. Thank you, Roger. Just to sort of uh, kick off the debate, I've been thinking carefully about this since we had our meeting in the executive and uh, noting where we are as, as a party. I've actually changed my mind in the context of, of this motion. And this is just to sort of kick off some discussion. Hmm? Look, the reason I've changed my mind on it is seeing where the party is now, that we desperately need to attract and make ourselves available for new, for new members, which is more Australians to join us, uh, pick up the flag, find out what we're about, get some newsletters, think that's a good idea after receiving the first three newsletters and opening up their hearts and minds to what we're about. Mm -hmm. Now, if I sit on a roadside stall in... Um, Goulburn and talk about this fantastic new social movement called Fusion or whatever our name will be in the future. And so look, you know, it's a community party. It's a party that's looking to innovate. There's lots of opportunities for you to meet other people from around the country talking about the same debates. You know, you can, you can take it seriously. You can take it socially. You can take it out of interest. It's a lot easier to get their email and to get them to sign up without asking for 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, is, the, is the cost of that barrier, that $20 barrier, I mean, once people give you some money, they've made a commitment, you know, and uh, they make a commitment. And often people don't make a commitment lightly in the busy lives that we lead. My feeling is that if we are looking to build a war chest and to grow our capital capacity, my point of view at this stage is that we don't have a membership fee. We really make a big, strong attempt to grow our members, members by 10,000 members over the next 12 months by social media and roadside stands, etc. And then by engaging them and attracting them, be it through our newsletters, be it through our workshops, be it through our events, be it through our visibility, go back to them regularly and ask for donations. And so we want to continue doing this work. We'd like you to do it. And every fortnight, hammer them with the need that we need to raise our war chest. Um, that is an, another way of approaching it. The reason I like that way is that it's much more accessible to everyday Australians to say, yeah, look, I'll give this a go. Uh, let's find out what they're about. If I don't like it, I'll, I'll uh, disappear. Um, the technical barrier to it, of course, is our constitutional obligations like quorum, et cetera. And that technical barrier can be dealt with by dealing with a constitution rather than creating a financial hurdle every time we want to get a new member. So that's a different point of view that I've been considering carefully. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I, I was... 
I've been thinking much the same since uh, since we had this discussion. This is something that that I brought up um, with the executive as well as introducing introducing this. And I think the alternative, like you mentioned, is um, is really hammering that engagement and campaigning side of things. Um, the only reason why parties don't get money in between elections is because it's only at elections that they're actually talking with their members and that's when the money comes out but if we are successful in keeping the flow going throughout the um throughout the terms then that shouldn't be the same for us um we should be able to build up that um that chest as we go um based on smaller smaller campaigns and continued engagement so that's a that's a really good point um miles you got your hand up too Yeah, I've spoken elsewhere. I'm, I think I've spoken elsewhere. I'm mostly opposed to this for reasons that have pretty much all been said, uh, but I can add more depth, more context on them. Um, I think that the, uh, from, a, from a financial perspective, I'm not really convinced that it's that important that we, we're that desperate for money. Like we've got, uh, as you saw in the financial reports, that we've got a, we've raised a significant amount of money, we've disbursed a significant amount of money. Sorry, Miles, your audio is really ordinary. Uh, sorry, I hope hopefully this is better. So the um, as we saw in the financial reports, we've got enough money to get by. We could always spend more, but campaigning is a black hole in terms of money. We could always put more money into it. And uh, whereas in, in terms of member numbers, we're likely to fail to achieve Victorian state registration due uh basically because we haven't got enough numbers and so that victoria was probably the easiest state to go for state registration at this current stage and so to my mind we need the members more than we need the money and and so while yes it's fair enough that we'll, we'll get members who are potentially in, in theory more committed and the money could go towards helping more member growth but it's a it's a small it is a small barrier and uh, and as a barrier, it's something that we can remove to prioritise member growth. Oh, thanks, Miles. Um, Andrea? Um, yep. In direct um, uh, answer to the what Miles just mentioned about the Victorian campaign, we sent very little communications to the, our Victorian members. We didn't chase them up very much. We had a supplementary list um, that followed our initial application. We sent um, so an extra 30 members on top of the initial uh, 600 and something. And I don't think those 30 members ever got any um, communication from us to say, expect a letter in the mail, please send it back. So it's, it's hard to say that we don't have enough members in Victoria when the follow-up of those members was so uh, minimal. Um, regarding the central question of a, a, a membership fee, I, I could go either way. I like to think that it's not too much of a barrier as long as you can say, uh, hey, could I get a discount? And immediately that's approved. Um, I also like the... Um, the approach that's been brought up in the chat of having perhaps a nominal fee of, you know, has to be minimum $2 um, if they want that tax deduction and they don't necessarily, but I think taking a uh, donation of less than $2 is a bit weird anyway. So there could be a $2 donation option as well. Um, alternatively, a third option is something that's been talked about a little bit, which is having free sign up but then um, a paid membership for being a voting member um, so I don't think that's come up in this discussion yet that anybody can sign up and be a member for the purposes of uh, being one of our minimum 1500 members with the AEC um, but you do have to either pay or request the fee waiver if you want to be a voting member at meetings like this Yep, no, they have very good points. And no, I don't think that had been raised. I think we've had uh, it's come up in like some side conversations since we had the uh, discussion at exec, but not in this this forum. So it's really good. 
Um, I just want to add, um, I was putting it into the chat, but it's easier to just say it. I think um, it's this um, coincides again with the long-term vision. Do we want to be a registered party with a bank full of inactive members or do we want to be a registered party with active members that can recruit more members? Because it is quite um, a time sink, uh, which translates into a cost sink when we have a database full of inactive members. Good point. Um, Alex? Uh, hey, um, as a vaguely left-wing party, it feels somewhat distasteful to have two classes of membership gated on, I guess, financial contribution. Um, like, there's definitely practicalities around it, but it does feel kind of weird compared to the rest of our values. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anyone else is feeling that tension, but I am. Um, I think I am, as I said it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a point to consider as well. And yeah, we should explore that. Sorry, I did also just forget a direct response to... Oh, God, it slipped my mind again. I guess I'll just put in the chat when it comes to me. Write it down so don't forget. Yeah, look, um, in, in growing, I think our, our capacity to build our war chest is, it's a two-way process, you know, it's a process of what purpose benefit does this party give our members, you know, and some will want to say, hey, I'm just part of a movement, some will want to see some interesting news, some will want to have a laugh next time we wear a koala suit or a, or a fusion powered reactor and drive it into Canberra or whatever may be the case, but others will want to see some really great campaigning. So there'll be a diversity of reasons that people want to join fusion mm -hmm. and join us mm -hmm. in our movement. And it's up to us to engage them to the point where they can build our war chest and build our resources. And it's not just about money. It's engaging them to join our working groups. It's engaging them to be a candidate. Um, money's probably the easiest to achieve out of all of those things. So I'd like to see us, I mean, my, my view, I reiterate, my view is to make it a very low entry point to be able to get their email address and their telephone number, and then us to then work hard to engage them and give them value and meaning so they can then invest that into us. Um, that's the process I see, and I think money is the least of our needs from our members at this stage. Yep. Andrew, you had your hand up. Yeah, I think we should be clear about what the purpose of the membership fee is. Is it for raising money or is it to give people a sense of investment? I think it's um it's hard to try and pursue both at once. So we should decide what the membership fee is for. And I, I lean towards investment. So someone either um, either pays a membership fee or sends the email to say, hey, can you waive the fee? And, you know, there's, we'd always say yes. Yep, well, that's, um, that's a fair point because they are two very distinct um, purposes to have uh, asking for money. Um, the building a war chest part, so the for context, what I was looking at when I suggested this to the exec as well was um, I think my desire to have more planning around elections. Um, so I know at the time running my first election this year and not knowing really what to expect, what I needed to put in, how much stuff um, was, was needed and how much money would go into it. 
um, was constantly on my mind. Uh, and we didn't really have a lot in the bank at the time. Like we had some, but it was mostly like we got to hold on to that just in case, just in case, like, well, just in case of what. Um, whereas having more money up front, I think, would allow us well in advance to say, we're going to need this many shirts, we're going to need this many stickers, we're going to start advertising on all of these platforms six months out rather than two weeks out because we had an extra thousand dollars up our sleeve. We actually allocate and budget ahead of time based on knowledge that we've got money available. So um, in, in all of the discussions pretty much today, it's funny how so many people are, are looking to work in an agile perspective, but I like planning. I like to know what we've got in the chest. I like to know that 12 months out, we're doing a thing. Nine months out, we're doing a thing. Six months out, we're doing a thing. And we're not held back by saying, we're at the 12 month mark, but who's sending the email? And do we have enough money? And what's the system that we're doing it on? And have we called these people? Having that planned, and laid out well in advance, I think would take a lot of stress off um, coming into those kinds of events. I know it would definitely have taken a lot of, of that mental um, stress off of, off of me, but I'm the kind of person who freaks out with that kind of stuff, right? So, but I think it's, um, it's beneficial. And that was the, the purpose in my mind behind building up that chest, but whether it's through a membership fee or, just continually raising money from our members anyway. So I actually, I'm now being swayed by, by your arguments as well as to say it would be better off just to let people in for free, but constantly engage with them and use our, our ongoing campaigns um, to raise money as we go. Um, but again, it has to happen. And it has to happen with a view in mind, like what's what's it going to be spent for? Um, we we spent, like I mentioned earlier, over sixty thousand dollars between all of the um, the candidates in the last election. And I reckon if we'd known in advance what we what we had up our sleeve, um, it would have been it could have been more. The majority of that was spent by the candidates and then reimbursed afterwards. Um, as opposed to planned ahead. So that's that's my thinking. Yep. Go on, um, Andrea. Yep. The science party's always found that during an election campaign, you just have to ask for money and often you'll get it. So um, Saha was always asking on social media, mm. hey, it costs a lot of money to run a campaign. There's $2,000 just registration and then all the materials and um, I think raised $5,000 that way. But it you have to be constantly asking people because people see it once and they think oh nah twice they start to think about it like when you start to feel that you're about to vomit from asking for donations people maybe start to think about donating so we can't be shy about asking for donations um and uh, trying to minute and ask questions doesn't work thanks <laughs> Sorry, we should have had a backup. No, uh, good. Minute. Um, Peter. Yeah, look, just to change change topic. It's related, but to change topic a little bit. Um, one of the things that I would like to see us, I guess, debate and sort out is a twelve month strategic plan. Actually, document uh, within the limited resources we've got. You mentioned money being a worry in terms of your considerations of how to best plan in the past. And I mean, so we've got resources, you know, we'll have some policy, we'll have some members, we have some money. What can we actually do over a 12 month period and then just sort of focus and limit our strengths onto those core tasks rather than being in a situation of being reactive to, um, you know, what may come up in terms of election campaign, do we have candidates, do we not have candidates? I found that 
even if it's a well-articulated plan, even if we achieve 50% of it, we're miles ahead rather than not having a very planned structure. So I guess that involves the finances and what sort of money we want to raise for the next federal election now. You know, do we want to have a target of 300,000 or for half a million for the next federal election and how are we going to get there in two years? So I see planning and a, and a documented plan, uh, focusing and articulating our activities is a very useful thing at this stage. I think we've matured to the point where we better understand the resources that are available in front of us and the challenges that are coming to be able to actually document something. So it's a bit related, but I guess I want to raise that as, a, as something I'd like to see us do in the next 12 months. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, no, it definitely uh, ties in, I think, um, with, with both both chains of thought, right, with having um, members and growing our membership as well as having a war chest and growing our war chest. Both of those, um, you know, everyone's called out the, the other state elections that are happening over the next couple of years. For the next federal elections, it's only potentially two years away. It'll be 24, 25. Um, I'm assuming it'll be into 2025. But uh, you never know, it could be called early. So, um, and, and even sorry, sorry, Roger, even more than that, we've got state elections coming up with an ACT, we've got local council elections all over the place. You know, what do we want to commit to? What do we want to plan against? How do we organically grow our party in the midst of elections every few months? You know, um, so that's a complexity facing us at this stage. We've taken on a very big challenge. and Or do we just say, look, we're a federal party and that's where we'll focus? Um, yeah. Just following on from what you're saying, mate. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Well, noting we can't actually make a motion for, um, for the membership fee suggestion anyway. Um, so we have notified the members that we that that will go ahead, but uh, I think it'll be important to have you know circulate or at least make available this discussion as well uh, in between now and the next fortnight um, for the decisioning around that. Um, and in terms of that amount, um, it's a it's an interesting one constitutionally. It calls out that um, the membership fee is a recommendation from the executive to uh, the members at an AGM. Doesn't actually specifically call out that it needs any particular type of vote. Um, so I think it's it's probably something that's relatively easy to change based on. Um, you know, statistics or or how how things operate. Um, that's kind of a, in my mind, a BAU kind of activity to set um, different rates. Obviously, with the um, with it being communicated and um, and going through things, and there will be other um, special general meetings in the future as well. So. It could potentially trial something and and revoke in future if needed. Um, Andrea, you're going to call me out and call me a liar. Uh, I just remember what I was going to say. So on the point of engagement and um, renewal of membership, actually, that there's a new feature coming into Nation Builder, which is um, the the database that we use for managing our members, amongst other things. Um, that will help members be able to log in and see when their membership is coming up for annual renewal. So that could be helpful um, as well if we can, it could help us as organisers remind everyone when their uh, membership is up for renewal and that could take the place of having a membership fee that you annually have to uh, actively confirm your membership. The end. 
and that also lets people see their recurring donations if they have them. Uh, it's great if we can get someone to um, commit to a recurring donation so we know what's coming in in the future. Um, wait, isn't that the case currently in Nation Builder? Um, Alex, what's coming in is called a member portal or a membership portal, which is an extra, it, it's an easier way for members to log in and see their membership start dates. So we can, as admins or people managers, can log in and see um, that for a person, but it's a bit difficult to get a report annual positive membership renewal. Um, we haven't implemented that for Fusion. It's only been a year. <laughs> Clicking a button that says renew membership, we haven't done it. Um, it's only been a year, so maybe we could, but it's not in place at the moment. Yeah, uh, it, it's sorry, a I'll, setting. I'll hop on voice. Um, to so um, was in in science. Did you not um, have people actively renew their membership each year? Did it just roll over if they did nothing? Some years, yes. Some years, no. It changed. Okay, because like our experience is, um, people don't renew. Um, like they they don't realize they haven't renewed. It's a it's a wild time. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll I'll jump back out of line. Um, I know Peter's got his hand up. Um, yeah, just continuing with the discussions on different things. I probably didn't spend as much time as I wanted to talk about the significance of the discussion on the name change or the assessment of a name change or the potential or maybe keeping fusion. I wanted to make sure that, you know, we commence the process today. I did put it in the chat area and I think we'll be sending out an email in the next few days. I see this as an opportunity of really engaging our members and uh, consolidating their, their views as well. So it's on is what I wanted to say. All I consider it, Roger, correct me if I'm not, but the process has started today. Yeah, so it was officially endorsed by um, by the executive. So, and you've um, presented that uh, the document, which we can circulate with our members um, separately. We'll also um, have a discussion on Wednesday. I'll bring it up then as well at the monthly member meeting. Um, because now it's just a process of formalizing, you know, what's the working group? When are we going to meet? Um, those kinds of things. But yes, yeah. that process is definitely um, kicking off and good yeah. to, to start engaging. So um, probably something to work with, uh, with Andrea or whoever uh, leads up the, uh, the comms, comms team once Andrea becomes the secretary. Um, to, to talk about how we uh, communicate that out um, to our members and get those emails and things out. But yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, I did add just um, back on the previous point briefly, I added a link into um, into the chat it's for the member portal now at the moment we don't really have um most members with with logins so you might find that link doesn't really go anywhere um but that's something that that we'll be we'll be working with uh in the future and i think in terms of um the expiry uh, yeah, at the moment, Fusion doesn't expire after a year, um, but I think with um, with the timeframes hopefully coming down to a 14-day notice, um, assuming that the constitutional changes go through, uh, I think that would be something that we can enable through Nation Builder so that that notification is basically sent out Um 
automatically from Nation Builder. But similar to the raising money part, I think the way to not let members drop off after a year is to maintain that engagement. Um, so if they're if they're constantly involved and in receiving our emails and coming along to monthly member meetings, getting the occasional phone call, uh, then they'll probably be more likely to um, to renew. Uh, so for that item, in terms of going to a vote, we'll continue on in the next fortnight, but I'll also make it, um, you know, present what this discussion was like to those people who were able to make it um, then in case there's a, a particular way they would like to vote. I think I'm going to have to drop off. Cool. That's uh, that's the end of our formal proceedings anyway, Andrea. So I think in terms of of minutes, thank you very much. Um, and just in general, your contribution. Um, thank you. I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if people want to chat about other things. Um, but otherwise, uh, we can wrap up formal proceedings. Oh, looking forward to the voting period and seeing you all in a couple of weeks, but also monthly member meeting on Wednesday. Be there or be square. Be there and be square. And square. <laughs> cool. Okay, thank you everyone. Great to talk, bye. Thanks, thank Peter. You. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks everyone. Uh, is anyone sticking around or do we wanna drop off now? Thank I'm you. Around five minutes. Five thank minutes. you. I'll I'll have to go, but thank you, everyone, and great stuff. No worries. Thanks, Cami. Thank you. Thank you. Electron. Ron would be stoked. You could definitely bring up uh, bring up Electron as a uh, as a option for uh, for the new name. It may not change. Um, I think this is an opportunity to really embed uh, whatever uh, that is. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Um, so, you know, I think Fusion has gained a bit of momentum um, over the last year. So it may well be that it maintains its, uh, its place and we go on with that forever forward. Um, yeah. We'll see what comes out of the out of the process. It'd be interesting to see what people come up with as their um, as their ideas. Hmm. That was so a fun debate. <laughs> the little candidate debate we just had. I don't think I debated that much as a candidate, so <laughs> got it out of me. <laughs> That was good. Good session. All right, I might. Uh, I'll stop the recording and then, because there's only a few of us left, and then we'll um, we'll wrap up. Um.